My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's about standards and public life. No, I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, Narendra. I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GV News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's eight o'clock. Welcome to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. Three hours of debate and plenty of entertainment along the way. As always, we start the show from eight till nine with the People's Hour, taking your video calls. We'll get to those after the news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Thank you, Mark. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The head of the London Fire Brigade says firefighters who are found to have bullied colleagues or been racist, misogynistic or homophobic will be sacked. Andy Rowe has promised a zero-tolerance approach after an independent review found a toxic culture within the service. Accounts in the report ranged from a black firefighter who had a noose placed by his locker to women being groped and people having their helmets filled with urine. The review was commissioned after a trainee firefighter took his own life in 2020. His mother has welcomed the findings. We're going to conduct a five-year case review, so we look back across all those cases, those terrible behaviours, those examples of bullying and harassment, uh, which have been considered before in AFB, uh, and put them back through that externally accredited process. And I do expect some people to be dismissed as a result. We will become the first service in the country to wear body-worn video cameras to ensure both the safety of our own staff and, and, and to reassure the public. So those are examples of what we're doing immediately. A woman has died and around 10 people are missing after landslides caused by heavy rains on the Italian island of Ischia near Naples. The mudslide cut through a port town engulfing buildings and sweeping uh, homes and cars into the sea. Dozens of people are reportedly stranded inside their homes and hotels, cut off from rescue teams who continue to search for victims. The Met Office says rain and strong winds are also expected across southern England and Wales. The yellow alert in those parts of the UK runs until 3am tomorrow. Buses and rains will likely be affected. The former Scotland Rugby Union international Doddy Weir has died at the age of 52. Weir was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in December 2016. He won 61 caps for his country and was selected for the successful British and Irish Lions tour to South Africa in 1997. Weir used his profile to raise awareness of the condition and generated funds through his charity foundation. And the flash dance and fame singer Irene Cara has passed away at the age of 63.
The Oscar and Grammy winning musician is best known for singing and co-writing the song Flashdance, What a Feeling. Her publicist announced her passing at her Florida home on Twitter. The cause of her death is still unknown. And that is it for the moment. Uh, now it is back to Mark Dolan tonight. My thanks to Aaron Armstrong, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. We start with the People's Hour, in which I'll be taking your video calls on the big stories of the day. Tonight, the stars of the show are Lars from Windsor in Berkshire, Fergus from Greenwich in London, Sue from Sandback in Cheshire, and Alan from Yateley in North Hampshire. The topics we will be debating are as follows. Has Britain got a gambling problem? Is class still a barrier to success? And is Christmas now too commercial? And my Saturday sidekick for the first hour of the show is the deputy leader of UKIP, Rebecca Jane. After nine, in my big opinion, EasyJet are recruiting people in late and middle age. This is good news. Older people have so much to offer the workplace and the economy. Bring on grey power. In the big question, following an array of vicious attacks and with so much fouling on the streets, should dogs be kept on a lead at all times? We'll speak to a vet and an animal behavioural expert. Plus, we're joined by the queen of US showbiz, royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, live from Hollywood, California. And in the news agenda with my panel, with the announcement of a new male pill, can men be trusted with contraception? Good luck with that. As Primark and Poundland open a load of new stores, are cheap shops just as good? And as a man meets the king in plastic sandals, is it time to rock the Crocs? What are the rules around appropriate footwear? Plus, tomorrow's paper's live and uninterrupted 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, right through until 11. In my take at 10, are you sick of everyone being offended by everything after Waitrose cut scenes from an advert with farmers comparing suntans? I'll be discussing that story later. So this is Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. Put something cold and fizzy in the fridge or fire up the kettle and let's have a night to remember. Your video calls in just a moment, but first my look back at the week in Dolan's Diary. The World Cup has kicked off and as England obsess over rainbow badges and the Germans perform their own special protest in favour of LGBTQ plus people, both teams flop on the pitch. It would seem going woke doesn't do much for your goal difference and virtue signalling doesn't get you three points. It was bizarrely ironic that England took the knee last night in memory of the appalling murder of George Floyd whilst their opponents, the USA, in whose country this crime happened, did not. Does that make sense to you? Me neither. It's almost like these teams should concentrate on kicking a pig's bladder around the pitch for 20 minutes, or even 90, rather than being saviours of the world. Following last night's hopeless draw to the US, England are currently on both knees, not just one. Workers at a warehouse owned by fashion giant Boohoo have compared themselves to slaves this week, walking seven and a half miles a shift in 32 degree heat, as MPs compare these disturbing conditions to a Victorian workhouse. It's a disgrace, obviously, and it brings a new meaning to the term shop till you drop. Proposed rail strikes will wipe £1.2 billion off the economy as Britain enters a winter of discontent. On the positive side, it means the public won't be paying £7.50 for a stale egg and cress sandwich on the, cup, uh, on the buffet car of the train, and they won't have to go through the indignity of the toilet door automatically opening whilst they're still performing their ablutions. Frankly, I'd rather fly. At least the toilet door locks properly on a plane. As Rishi Sunak refuses to admit whether he has private medical insurance in a Sky News interview, given the fact that his party still trail miles behind Labour in the polls, his blood pressure must be so high he's probably got Booper on speed dial. 
Could a spin doctor help? Speaking of health, Vladimir Putin fears he will be killed because there is no forgiveness for czars who lose wars in Russia. Well, it could be worse. He could be sent to the jungle for three weeks with this guy. That's what I call a terrifying reptile. I'll take the gulag every time. A woke theatre group has cancelled its performance at Sheffield's Crucible Theatre in protest over their decision to stage the musical Miss Zygon as they condemn its damaging tropes, misogyny and racism. Quite right too, so many of these musicals are dripping in prejudice. You have to feel for how hyenas are portrayed in The Lion King. Sister Act is rude about nuns and Beauty and the Beast is outrageously insulting for ugly blokes everywhere. And that was Dolan's Diary. With me throughout the show is Rebecca Jane, Deputy Leader of UKIP. RJ, welcome to the show. Hi. I believe that the World Cup has been tainted by this obsession with rainbow flags. Mm. Why can't footballers just play football? I know, you know, the whole rainbow flags taking the knee. It's like, what's coming next? Why are we making football so political? And it feels like it's a really loud political voice that is currently being spoken in this World Cup particularly. Mm. Um, and yeah, you know, let's just go back to having... There's no fun in this World Cup. Where's that gone? Who cares? Well, this is it. And, and the point is, you know, that obviously what happened to George Floyd, it was an awful mm. uh, drama, a tragedy in America, a, a great crime. Um, and, you know, we all hate racism. Mm. But why is it the job of professional sport to virtue signal in this way? I mean, we don't do these gestures before we start a day's work, do we? It doesn't happen at a branch of Sainsbury's when they open in the morning. Why has football decided to be so political? I know, and I don't agree with what they have done. I understand in one respect why they're doing it, because they have such a spotlight on them that they're mm. clearly using it and trying to do a good purpose. But, you know, last night, they took the knee and all the Americans were like, what are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous if they don't even care. And I obviously, I tweeted about it last night and, um, well, I got a lot of support, but I also got a lot of, oh, racist this, racist that. Do you know what? They're taking the knee for an organisation that has been disproven and that actually did a lot of profit and now everybody's saying it's not just about that organization it's about everything else that's wrong with the world where do we draw a line uh, black lives definitively mm. absolutely matter and that's yeah. what's so clever about that snake oil name that black lives matter have as an organization an organization that have campaigned for the destruction of the nuclear family and the end of capitalism and the uh, the disbanding of police forces around the world yeah and I really do feel like it did quite a lot of damage to a lot of police forces. And in some respects, absolutely rightly so, because I don't agree with what happened. But we do have to just take a step back, actually, and just stop making everything political and stop making everything about a statement. We don't have to make a statement about everything. You know, it's like when um, a supermarket chain did two caterpillars for Valentine's Day of the same gender. And it's like, we don't have to do this. We don't have to put a flag out for everything that we see. Otherwise, at what point do you get exhausted during the day for every single thing that you could point out? Yeah, Walt, too right. Um, let's do some politics with you because you are the deputy leader of UKIP. Yes. And uh, you might uh, sniff a potential electoral opportunity at the next election because mm. Rishi Sunak continues to trail Keir Starmer in the polls. Mm. Um, the, the Rishi bounce is officially over. Are the Tories toast? Yes, I hope so. Goodness me, could anybody actually stomach another term with them lot in power? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, I, I'm obviously not for Labour either. Um, Is there I... a lesser of two evils from UKIP's point of view? Listen, from my point of view and from UKIP's point of view, there's only one option, and that is to align all centre-right splinter parties under one banner. I I'm trying my best. <laughs> It's a difficult job to do. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot of different organisations to have that conversation. But for me, we all have to come together because mm. the two mainstream parties are not optional anymore for me. Uh, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, Keir Starmer now is getting quite Brexity in his language. He has said that free movement is a red line for him. He will not tolerate a Swiss-style deal mm. for the UK. 
Uh, so he's gone from being Mr Second Referendum to Mr Brexit. Do you buy it? No. Don't buy, buy a word that he says. Of course not. He's seeing what the public want and he's just tailoring his tune to make it sound like he cares when actually he doesn't. He can't be trusted, just like Conservatives can't be trusted, and we need an alternative option. It's that simple and all chances of being exhausted with those two parties for me completely and utterly, and there is no way back. You can't believe a word that any of them say. Uh, briefly, uh, a uh, theatre company in Sheffield have cancelled uh, their production because the Crucible are showing Miss Zygon. Now, apparently, it turns out Miss Zygon is very triggering, very offensive to lots of people. Apparently, it's quite misogynistic. Apparently, it's a bit racist. God knows. But uh, what do you think about this? This is just more cancel culture, isn't it? Yeah, sick of it. <laughs> I think it's very clear what my lines are on this one. It's somewhere we've got to draw a line. This has got to stop. We're losing the right of free speech and it's actions like that that are taking us back centuries, decades, whatever you want to call it. This has got to stop. Well, people have been enjoying Miss Zygon for generations, yeah. haven't they? Uh, but apparently now we're so sophisticated, that kind of stuff has to be cancelled and chucked into the dustbin of history. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you see this going? Does the <laughs> woke fight back ever happen? Or have oh, they won? The walk, the walk fight back is well and truly happening. Mm -hmm. And if we don't continue to fight back against it, in five years' time, Father Christmas will be tossed. Yeah, yeah now that, you're talking. That's well, not OK. Yeah, he is a bit... <laughs> he is a... He is a bit white, isn't he? Um, OK, uh, look, uh, lots to get through in the People's Hour. Up next, I'll be asking my viewers, does Britain have a gambling problem? See you in two. We are GB News, the People's Channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. That's and it's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Mirinda. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6pm, only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News.
Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Welcome to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In and the People's Hour, in which I put your video calls to the national airwaves and get your opinions uh, aired across the country. Uh, let's kick off with our first topic. With over 400 gambling-related suicides a year in England, should more be done to control gambling in this country? Maybe by limiting how much users can gamble or by getting rid of gambling adverts on TV. But here's the first question in the People's Hour. Does Britain have a gambling problem? First up to discuss this, I'm delighted to say we can welcome Lars to the show from Windsor. Hi, Lars. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm very well. Great to have you on the show. Do you think that Britain has got a gambling problem? Um, clearly it has. The government seems to think so, to the point which then they're now looking at opening 15 gambling clinics um, in the UK. Um, if you look at some of the statistics from, from April 21 to March 22, there were 1,013 referrals to gambling clinics. And um, that's up from 775 um, the year before. And of course, there isn't also a long-term plan to open the 15 by 23, 24. So it clearly there appears to be a need for it. Um, and with you've got there's a hundred there's 136,000 people roughly that have a gambling problem, and 1.3 million people seem to have um, access or are engaging in gambling sites. The problem is that the government aren't exactly financially disinterested from gambling, are they? They benefit from the massive tax revenues that it generates. Yes, it does. Um, but also football teams seem to, get, seem to benefit from the massive amounts of advertising revenues from, from gambling. So it could be a question of regulating the advertising like they did in the Formula One industry with cigarettes. You know, is there now a, a time to consider regulation? Well, I think that's not a bad shout. And they're getting them started very young. They've got uh, teenagers now uh, on apps, which are effectively gambling, but just on your smartphone. Yes, and it's interesting because um, particularly my daughters, I lose, I lose control over my daughter's um, smartphone apps when she reaches 13. She has to give me permission to um, control what she looks at, which I find, I find quite bizarre, really. Yep, the shoe is on the other foot. Let's bring Alan into this conversation. Alan joins us from Yateley in North Hampshire. Hi, Alan. Hi, Mark. Uh, good to have you on the show. Now, Alan, I understand that you are a retired teacher, is that correct? Amongst other things, yes. Yeah, and um, we just spoke there with Lars about children, and it does seem that a lot of these games that kids play quite legally um, have parallels with the gambling experience. So, in a sense, they get hacked from an early age. Also, the thing to remember, which is very, very important, is gambling, just like alcohol, just like smoking, is an addiction. And when you're getting these children at an early age getting involved in these games, in inverted commas, they, you are getting them into an addiction. Now, there are good, there are good um, associations like Alcohols, Alcoholics Anonymous who do a great job. There is also Gambling Anonymous. You don't hear about them very often. But again, as the previous um, person me mentioned, that there, are, um, there is a, a situation with advertising. Now, advertising on alcohol and cigarettes is finished. It should be also the case with gambling, whereas especially, and even your station, GB News, you advertise gambling. And I think that should be stopped. That should be prohibited. 
Um, so I'm not in favour of any publicity for gambling, and um, and it should, I think something should be done about it. And you could have given me an easy subject to talk about, like Brexit. Um, but, um, but anyway, but but basically, it is it is an it is an addiction. Something should be done about it. Advertising should be stopped, and um, and the young children, especially with their smartphones and all their little apps and everything else, are becoming addicted. And a stop's got to be put to that. It is dangerous, and it is going to get worse and worse unless something is done. It's funny you should mention Brexit, the ultimate gamble, the ultimate roll of the dice, but one that I believe will come good. Uh, stay with us, Alan. Let's bring Lars into this conversation as well. And uh, Lars, what do you think about high-profile celebrities uh, flogging various betting apps? You know, former football players, current football stars, actors, TV comedians, you name it. It's, it's, a, it's another form of advertising reality, isn't it? You're just getting a celebrity or somebody children look up to to advertise a product. I mean, there are these, these, these products. Alan makes a really good point about, you know, children. And there are these products that are designed to make children addicted to the gaming world, which could easily be transferred to the gambling world when they, when they become of age to gamble. And actually, what's to stop children getting access to these apps either because you know you you're the age the age in which you can join things like not that children use facebook but the analogy is there is it, it's, it's around 13 but but i know i know parents whose children you know eight nine ten are on are on these apps what do we how do we control ch children's access to these apps and also some of these gaming world um programs encourage people to buy tokens to carry on using those programs so it's no different to you buying um chips on an online gambling store the idea obviously is that when you place those chips you might win some money but as we all know the um the betting companies always win yeah don't they just uh, rebecca jane is my presenter's friend for the People's Hour. She's the deputy leader of UKIP. RJ, to what extent do you think this is a particularly British problem, gambling? Uh, I am not on the same page. Um, so, obviously, as somebody that does work in the mental health arena, and I personally oversee the triaging of hundreds of people every um, year, <clears throat> gambling is actually quite low down on our list of the things that we see. Um, different addictions, obviously, to alcohol and to drugs, are, are they are very, very prominent for us. Gambling, less so. However, what I would say is that I do think that um, the, the country needs more mental health services, um, and I kind of encompass gambling into, into that arena. So that's kind of where my take on it goes. I don't think it's as big a problem as it's being made out, but I think that the mental health um, problem in Britain is absolutely huge. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the concern. Uh, the, the, point, the point here, Alan, is that more and more people are getting sucked into gambling. However, there will be many watching who just take the view, look, I enjoy a flutter. Don't demonise all of us. There's a big difference between a flutter and an addiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're in the office, when people used to go to the office, when you're in the office and they have a sweep state for the Grand National or something like that, it's harmless. But when you're down the betting shop, every 10 minutes, putting bets on, that's a totally different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. so, so, yes, there is a, pro there is a, a problem for real mm -hmm. gamblers. Um, but, again, England... Britain isn't a serious gambling nation. There are other nations who are a lot, lot worse, um, from anything to to ludo to cockfighting. So believe me, I've been around the world. I've seen gambling in all shapes and sizes. We're not so bad in this country, but it's still bad because it's affecting our children, and they're growing up with it, and that's what's terrible. Yeah, well, Alan, I would never fight your cock, take my word for it. <laughs> Lars, uh, what about a more draconian approach? In the pre-show meeting, one of my colleagues suggested that we ban gambling altogether. That was the uh, 
series producer of the show, Tom Pollard. What do you think? Ban gambling altogether. Well, in a controlled environment, you're kind of like saying, well, let's get rid of fun. Let's mm. not have any, because these things are supposed to be fun, but there is a level where it becomes a bit too more than fun. There's a de There has to be a degree of self-control in the individual. And the reason they're addicted is it because they lack self-control. So actually, I'm not, I would never say get rid of the games altogether because you, all, you're, all you're then doing is policing fun. Which is not really the sort of sort of thing a dictatorship would do. <laughs> um, so I would I would keep them there, but there needs to be some control. But there also needs to be there needs to be some more con control made by the people doing it. So they set the limits for you, rather than you suddenly become addicted. And I and I agree I agree with and I forgot I apologise I forgot your name the deputy leader of the UK Rebecca J. That's okay. Unlikely, Forget her name at your peril. Very unlikely to agree with you, Kip, I can assure you. Um, the, yes, the, the, the mental health side of, of gambling is not as big as other areas of addiction, but it is still a problem. A fascinating conversation. Well, look, uh, Alan and Lars, please uh, stick around because we'll join you later in the People's Hour. Uh, but uh, let me say that if you're having trouble with gambling, you can visit gambleaware.org or their free phone number, which is 24 7, uh, the National Gambling Helpline, 0808 80 20 133. That's 0808 80 20 133, or just Google the National Gambling Helpline. If you're struggling, do reach out because help is out there. Uh, lots more to come in the People's Hour. Uh, next up, looking forward to this conversation. Uh, is class still a barrier to success? See you shortly. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great, great happening. Let him well, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. 
now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In and the People's Hour, in which I take your video calls. Let's get to our next topic and let's talk about the class system, with Oxford and Cambridge trying to get more state-educated pupils to apply for places and research, showing even people on high incomes cannot break through the glass ceiling. So, was the class system dismantled under Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, or is class still a barrier to success? First up to discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome Fergus to the People's Hour, all the way from Greenwich in London. Hi, Fergus. Watch your Mark. Good to have you back on the show. Uh, is class still the biggest barrier to success in your view? Yes, it is. I, I grew up with parents who said they were déclassé, they didn't have any class because my father was an actor, my mother was an artist, and they hated the idea of the class system. However, when I was a child actor a million years ago, I met royalty, I met upper class, middle class, lower class, working class, whatever you call them. And what I've noticed over the decades that have gone since then, the glass ceiling is really thick and mm. it's multi-layered. It's not double glazed or triple glazed, it's quadruple glazed. And I know people who work for the civil service and work for the corporate area and they go to meetings and they have this diversity and inclusivity meetings which is great and they're taking the notes of course and the people who went to public school eat and whatever they say yes we must do some inclusivity and then they go out of there having typed up the notes and they meet up with black people they work with indian people they work with arabic people they work with working class people they work with and the others walk past them. They don't talk to them. They don't mix with them. It's like there's a different world. And it's, I, I was thinking earlier, because I've been thinking about this topic a lot. George Orwell in Animal Farm, he said, yes, all animals are equal, do you remember? And then at the end, it's except pigs. That's yeah. horrible. I don't want to call them pigs, but they put themselves above all the other animals and they can't help it. It's the education. I know that brilliant report from Oxford today about, yes, we've got a lot more state school. Yes, but which state schools? The mm. ones in Deptford, the ones in Dulwich, the ones in North Finchley, or the ones in Peckham? Well, it'll be where their parents have moved into a very expensive house in a very selective area to go to the local state school where their children are getting a fantastic education. But those state schools, they don't pay for them, but I'm sure they get private things as well. And mm. um, what's her name, uh, Singh, uh, but, Babasinda Singh, I can't remember her name fully, who runs the schools fantastically in this country for working class people. And in America, you've probably heard of, about it from, um, oh, I can't remember his name now, it'll come back to me. Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell, the KIPP schools in America, where children in very poor areas are taught to believe in themselves and they fly and they can go through the glass barrier. But you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to be encouraged to believe in yourself. And so, yes, I'm afraid the class thing does still exist. And I've worked with some very senior executives. If I can just say, I was working with a very, very senior banker. And I had to say to him to do voice exercises because I trained, or used to always do, train people in presentation. And it's, they've got to do things like, wee oh dear, I made myself cough. It sounds like you got a touch of COVID I there. Said, when I was in the Royal Shakespeare Company, I had to do these exercises, such as my family friend, Dame Judi Dench. So he did the exercises. He then went to the man who introduced me. He said, yes, he's very good, but he's a, he's a bit of a name dropper, isn't he? <laughs> that wasn't my intention. 
because he's supposed to be up there and I'm down here and I'm in the lift in this bank. You know, where are you going to Closters? No, we're going to Saint-Tropez for the week. They can't even see me on the lift. They literally can't see me or hear me. I am totally invisible there. I'm not a member of the club, the family. I don't have the right time. No. Oh, I'll make myself <laughs> cough with the exercises. <laughs> OK, over to you, Mark. Sorry, I spoke too much. Blimey, uh, you're rocking the Omicron there. But listen, a, a pretty shocking story, but beautifully told. Uh, let's bring Sue in, if we can, as well. Sue is in Ashcombe and in Cheshire. Sue, I hope you got plenty of stories like that for me. Well, I don't think the class system does still exist. I think if you've got the determination and the information and the grit, you'll get anywhere you want to get these days. I do think that there's a lot of opportunity being lost because they got rid of grammar schools. I, I went to grammar school. Um, I could have gone to university and I chose not to, even in my day when it was free. But, uh, you know, people can do what they want nowadays. There's so much opportunity for people that wasn't there years ago. Yes, although don't you think, Sue, that money comes into it now, that that's the new class system, is the size of your bank balance, not who your parents were? Possibly, but, you know, I, personally, I have never, ever bothered what people, whether people earn a lot, um, earn a little, mm whether they've got money or not got money. I've always treated people the same and I've always got the same back from them. I don't see... I think class is in people's minds now. I think if you think I'm, I'm as good, you know, I'm as good as anybody on this planet and I don't care what anybody says and that's what I'm going to stick to. And I think if you've got that sort of attitude, you can get where you want to go these days, mm. so much more so than when I was young. Uh, definitely. Let's uh, bring Fergus back into this, Sue, because you're coming from slightly different angles there. And Fergus, Sue says that if you're determined enough, you will make it, come what may. Well, we can think of people like Alan Sugar, who came from the East End, who was intelligent. He was working on market store. I've read his biography, which I'd recommend to anyone. And he was working on a market store when he was a child. His father didn't believe in him. His mother did. And he just learned so much and he kept going. He ended up working for IBM. The great thing is, he, his friend said, you should be in sales and marketing. You shouldn't be working here. Years later, he bought the building from IBM, which he loved doing. Now that is success because they looked down on him because of his East End accent. Well, didn't he prove them wrong? So yes, she's right, of course. Sorry, Sue. You are right. You can break through the system, but it's about self-belief. The problem, I think, is with the public schools and the very expensive state schools. It's a problem and it's an advantage at the same time. They are taught masses of self-belief, masses of self-entitlement. And that means them and the ones who talk about clusters and talk about Santrop, and they don't notice the other people. Um, for example, I, years ago, a neighbor of mine was a dustman. And when he died, 17 of the people he emptied bins for, including Glenda Jackson in Southeast London, took their cars and went to his funeral because he was a total gentleman and we loved him to bits. And it wasn't about his education, it was about his personality. He was just such a lovely man. And people understand that sort of thing. But would he have tried to be an executive? No, he didn't want to be. Think of, and this does make me passionate actually, plumbers, electricians, plasterers, bricklayers, Painters and decorators are very highly trained. And if you can't get one, you are in trouble. And it's, I know it's been said a lot recently, you do need some serious apprenticeships. You really do. Don't yeah. send everybody for an academic career if they prefer to be a bricklayer. Because I've watched in my street, mm. I've watched some people plastering a wall round a corner. And I just said, can I just watch you? Because you're so good. And I was jealous. Yeah. Not that I'd ever try and... I'd never try and last around a circular wall but no i just admire anyone who can do stuff and if i need a plumber i'll call one no i definitely wouldn't blast around a circular wall unless you've had a few pints um let's bring <laughs> rebecca jane into this conversation she's the deputy leader of ukip and my presenter's friend for the first hour 
Um, RJ, didn't Margaret Thatcher dismantle the class system by letting people start their own businesses and purchase their own council accommodation? She tried. Didn't work. I'm sorry, no. Did, didn't she massively ex expand the scope of the, 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 the middle class in this country, bringing in people that identified previously as working class? I don't think it was particularly about a class system. I think it was about giving people more opportunities. You know, the question, does the class system still exist? Yes. Um, because we can't reinvent the wheel. People still judge each other on class, on appearance. It's very unfortunate. But isn't it, isn't it more bank balance now, isn't it, if you've got a Mercedes-Benz rather than a Ford? Even if you do have those things, you will still be judged on your upbringing <coughs> and where you come from and what you do and what you look like. It doesn't particularly matter. People will always judge and we're never going to completely get rid of that. And also, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Sue. Uh, thank you. Um, but, yes, yeah, Sue, so I... I I like your idea about it's about grit and determination. I like to think I've got a little bit of that. I've ended up as a deputy leader of, of obviously, of UKIP, so I've probably done all right by most people's standards. Um, do, am I still judged on my background? Absolutely. And that's actually probably one of the reasons why I'm in the position that I am. Um, and I'm all right to admit that. I don't want to be considered anything else. Um, but I don't think that grit and determination is going to get rid of everybody else's opinions and thoughts. Uh, Sue, you are the last word, so you get the last word. Well, I think one of the, one of the things that I didn't have when I was young is information. When, uh, when we had things like um, careers conventions at school, I was at a girls' grammar school, so all the, all the careers that they showed, showed us, even when they looked at the military, they were nursing teachers, you know, that sort of thing, looking after people. They didn't, I didn't see a single solicitor or a barrister or, you know, anything like that. Even politicians, we don't have anybody from politics telling us we could do that. And if I'd have known a lot of that stuff when I was like 15, I would have been in the Houses of Parliament now or something like that or a barrister because those are the things that I am really interested in. So it's not just, it is grit and determination, but you've also got to have the information on, you know, where you can go. And your school has got to be very good at giving you the, the um, confidence. Yeah. A lot of schools, you know, that's confidence that, and, and belief in yourself that needs to be given at schools. Well, definitely. Uh, listen, what a fantastic conversation. Uh, we're going to send Fergus a bottle of uh, Benelin for that chesty cough of his. Uh, but they will both be back after the break, as will our other brilliant GB News viewers in the People's Hour. Next up, is Christmas now too commercial? See you shortly. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Uh, now, you would need to be living in a cave not to know that Christmas is coming with department stores full of Yuletide decorations already and Christmas markets popping up across our great British cities. But with record numbers of people buying gifts on credit rather than from savings, should we be aiming to have a budget Christmas this year? Is it as much fun without all of the drink, the food and the presents? And whilst it's a wonderful time of the year as friends and families get together, is Christmas now commercialised? That's the final topic of tonight's People's Hour, in which I take your video calls from 8 till 9. Uh, let's get the views now on whether Christmas is too commercialised with uh, Lars, who is uh, joining us from London, and Alan as well. So, gentlemen, uh, what do you think? Is Christmas too commercialised? Alan, I'll start with you has been for a long time. It's nothing new. As you know, I used to um, have a sailing company in Greece and I used to come back home at the end of the season in October. And I hated the fact that everywhere I went, it was Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. It shouldn't be publicized until December. It was very commercialized. Mm. And in fact, it puts you off Christmas. It doesn't encourage it. Uh, do you think families should possibly go for a budget Christmas this year? Um, how about siblings who are grown up saying, look, we won't do presents, uh, we'll just have a drink together? That's fine. I think that's great. It's the, it's the getting to get coming together and having the love of the family, which is what's important, not the size of the gift or the prize or the price of the gift that you're getting. Enjoy a family time, which is what Christmas should be about. Um, Lars, I assume you were given that shirt for Christmas. I can't imagine you bought it. <laughs> I did buy it, actually. <laughs> Very fetching. I'm only pulling your leg. Uh, do you think Christmas is too commercialised, or are we both, Alan and myself, being a pair of Scrooges? Well... I would say yes, it is, because it seems to come earlier every year. The, the shops seem to have more merchandise earlier and earlier and earlier. Obviously, as a father, I've got two children, so my children would think I'm bonkers by saying it's commercialised. But um, for one of being a Scrooge, we're actually, this year, we're, move, we're going to the Caribbean for Christmas rather than staying in the UK. So for us, we're, we're just going to, we're just going away. We're not putting any trees up, any decorations up, because all we have to do is take them down as soon as we get back. Lucky Lars, the drinks are on you. Um, Lars, whilst you're away, do you mind if I use your log cabin? <laughs> no, not at all. I could, I could probably, uh, I could strip naked in there and have a bit of a sweat. It looks appropriate. And, um, and let's, as well. let's bring uh, Fergus and Sue into this conversation. Sue, what are your plans for Christmas? I do dinner for the whole of my family, which is now eight people. 
cooked and I cooked dinner for them and we open our presents after it will be the King's speech this year, hopefully. Um, and then all the kids and um, everybody opens the presents then. We don't do it early. I do think it's far too much commercialised. And I, I dare say there's lots of people who don't even know that Christmas is about Christ's birth. I mean, I'm not religious, but I think, you know, that should be the priority. And it's getting harder and harder to find cards with anything to do with Christ and his birth nowadays. They're all cuddly little pictures and cartoons and things on them, which I can't stand. And I, yeah. I'm with, I'm with uh, Alan, is it, who says... Uh, Alan. I don't think it to be able to start until after the 1st of December. I don't think this this year it was from October onwards. I'm sick of it by now before I've even got to the day. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, exactly the thinking, and I think many will agree. Um, Fergus, will you be stuffing your bird this Christmas? I don't need to. She'll do it for me, darling. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lucky man. You don't even have to use your hands. No, no, hands free, hands free. Uh, Fergus, I mean, turkey. does Christmas still matter? Being being serious for a moment. I'll be eating turkey. I'll be watching all my favourite programmes on television, mm. which I love. Um, that, that to me is the resting thing. Now, at the risk of sounding like David Starkey, <laughs> Christmas goes back to the Saturnalia of the Romans and the Celts because that is the worst part of the year for everybody in the world. It's the coldest, the nastiest in the Northern Hemisphere. The Australians, it's the other way around, but they've inherited this. And so at that time of year, people wanted to kill off the winter. And indeed, where I used to live, you will have heard of this, people would take off the bin lids with a hammer or, or a spoon on New Year's Eve and hammer it at midnight. And a man would come in with a piece of coal. And what was it? Was it a candle? he would come in to make it OK, and he had to be dark-haired. Well, yeah. that's all gone. So now we've got... I'm sure you've read uh, Robert Cialdini's Influence. I'm sure you have, Mark. Sadly not. Very I I'm waiting for the oh, film. Man. Waiting for the film. Well, basically, what the shops do, they bring out these wonderful new toys a week or two before Christmas, and the children, Daddy, Mummy, can I have a... Can I have a Daddy, Mummy? And, of course, they go to the shop, and the shop says, Sorry, we've sold out because they want to have lots more in January. Because at Christmas, they've sold out, so they make sure they have a shortage. It's horrible. That side of Christmas is the over-commercialisation. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Sounds, that sounds pretty rough. Let's bring everyone in if we can. Let's have Lars and Sue and Alan and Fergus and Rebecca Jane as well. And let's have a collective vote. Raise your hand if you think that Christmas is too commercialised. Yeah, there you go. I think I'm going to add to that one as well. Um, does uh, Britain still have a class system? Is it a barrier to success? Please raise your hand if you think that the class system is a barrier to success. OK, well, that's actually a majority against. And last but not least, does Britain have a gambling problem? Raise your hand. There you go. OK, well, I think I might add to that as well. Uh, that would be four votes out of six. My thanks to my brilliant callers tonight, Sue, Fergus, Lars and Alan. Do come back soon. And thanks to Rebecca Jane, who joins us for the next two hours as part of Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. If you'd like to be part of the show, then uh, drop me a line right now, mark at gbnews.uk. I'd like to make you a star on The People's Hour. Uh, next up in my big opinion monologue, I'll be talking about good news for old people. Find out why after this. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way.
Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's about standards and public life. No, I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, Narendra. I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GV News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. In my big opinion, EasyJet are recruiting people in late and middle age. This is good news. Older people have so much to offer the workplace and the economy. In the big question, following an array of vicious attacks and with so much fouling on the streets, should dogs be kept on a lead at all times? Plus, we're joined by the Queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. In the news agenda with my panel, with the announcement of a new male pill, can men be trusted with contraception? As Primark and Poundland open a load of new stores, are cheap shops just as good? I'm a fan. And as a man meets the king in plastic sandals, is it time to rock the Crocs? What are the rules around appropriate footwear? And tomorrow's paper's live and uninterrupted, uh, 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, right through until 11.00. Lots to get through, but my big opinion is next after the headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Thank you, Marcus. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. The head of the London Fire Brigade says firefighters who are found to have bullied colleagues or been racist, misogynistic or homophobic will be sacked. Andy Rose promised a zero tolerance approach after an independent review found a toxic culture within the service. Accounts in the report ranged from a black firefighter who had a noose placed by his locker to women being groped and people having their helmets filled with urine. The review was commissioned after a trainee firefighter took his own life in 2020. We're going to conduct a five-year case review, so we look back across all those cases, those terrible behaviours, those examples of bullying and harassment, uh, which have been considered before in AFB, uh, and put them back through that externally accredited process and I do expect some people to be dismissed as a result. We will become the first service in the country to wear body-worn video cameras to ensure both the safety of our own staff and, and, and to reassure the public. So those are examples of what we're doing immediately. A woman's died and around 10 people are missing after landslides caused by heavy rain on the Italian islands of Ischia took place near Naples. The mudslide cut through a port town engulfing buildings and sweeping homes and cars into the sea. Dozens of people are reportedly stranded inside their homes and also in hotels, cut off from rescue teams who continue to search for victims. 
The Met Office says rain and strong winds are also expected in southern England and Wales. The yellow alert in those parts of the UK run until 3am tomorrow. Buses and trains are likely to be affected, in addition to the knock-on effect from today's rail strikes. Protests against coronavirus lockdown measures have erupted in China in response to the deaths of 10 people in an apartment fire linked to a lockdown. Demonstrators in the city of Urumqi claim efforts to rescue residents in the building were hampered by anti-COVID measures. Restrictions have been in place there since August. They are some of the most draconian lockdowns in the country. Earlier today, China reported a third amount, uh, a third record amount of coronavirus cases uh, for a third day, putting further pressure on President Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy. Former Scotland rugby union international Doddy Weir has died at the age of 52. Weir was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in December 2016. He won 61 caps for his country and was selected for the successful British and Irish Lions tour to South Africa in 1997. The Prince and Princess of Wales have paid tribute to the player, describing him as a hero and saying his tireless efforts to raise awareness of MND were an inspiration. You're up to date. That's it for the moment. Now back to Mark Dolan tonight. My thanks to Aaron, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. In my big opinion, EasyJet are recruiting people in late and middle age. This is good news. Older people have so much to offer the workplace and the economy. In my big question debate following an array of vicious attacks and with so much fouling on the streets, should dogs be kept on a lead at all times? Plus, we're joined by the Queen of US showbiz, royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. In the news agenda with my panel, with the announcement of a new male pill, can men be trusted with contraception? Good luck with that. As Primark and Poundland open a load of new stores, are cheap shops just as good? And as a man meets the king in plastic sandals, is it time to rock the Crocs? What are the rules around appropriate footwear? And tomorrow's papers live and uninterrupted, 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, right through until 11. And we'll get reaction to tomorrow's front pages at 10.20 with the former editor of the Sunday Mirror, Paul Conyu. Reacting to the big stories of the day is my all-star panel, deputy leader of UKIP, Rebecca Jane, Olympic legend and broadcaster, Chris Akabusi, and top political commentator, Albi Amancona. And in my take at 10, are you sick of everyone being offended by everything after Waitrose cut scenes from an advert with farmers comparing suntans? A harmless joke, you'd think, but apparently not. More on that later. Plus, as I say, we've got the papers as well. Lots to get through. Now, I want to hear from you throughout the programme. Mark at gbnews.uk. This show has a golden rule. Do you know what that rule is? We don't do boring. There's the camera. Come on, folks. It's Saturday night. They went to Weatherspoons before we went on air. Big mistake. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. So there you go for the next two hours. Big debates, big guests and always big opinions. Occasionally, the cameraman even does his job as well. Let's get started. I'm only kidding. Now, this news had me flying. I'm on cloud nine. The sky is the limit for my older viewers. EasyJets have launched a massive campaign to recruit workers over 45. What a brilliant idea. People in middle age and beyond have huge life experience. They've normally worked in at least one industry and bring a diversity of skills, values and opinions to the workplace. Whether you look at private corporations or indeed the public sector, the British workplace is institutionally ageist, with young being good and old invariably being bad. Look at the cull of mature talent at the state broadcaster, the BBC, where we've seen the departure of Arlene Phillips, Sue Barker, Simon Mayo, 
John Humphreys, and more recently, Steve Wright. We live in a youth-centric culture which sees anyone with grey hair as over the hill, old-fashioned and set in their ways, stubborn, rigid and uncool. It's the same in retail and hospitality. When was the last time you saw a pensioner behind the counter at Costa or Pret a Manger serving your coffee? I can't think of anything better than a woman in her 60s or 70s serving me a brew given she spent a lifetime making them. What happened to old barmen and old waiters? The last time I bought a telly was about 15 years ago at John Lewis, and I still remember the guy that sold it to me. He was called Dennis. He'd been flogging tellies at John Lewis for pretty much his whole career. He understood customers' needs and had massive knowledge about the products he was selling. I doubt Dennis is still there and I certainly doubt he would be recruited now. Obviously, you need youthful energy, absolutely, and it's terribly important that young people get the opportunities they need and deserve. It's important that when they leave school or graduate from higher education, that there is momentum in relation to their career. If they don't get in the habit of work early doors, they never will. But we need grey cells too, and we need wise heads. And given the fact that we're all living longer, it means that millions of people are well able to keep working into their 60s, their 70s, and maybe even their 80s. Charity work and volunteering, of course, are great options as well. And those who cannot work due to ill health or old age should, of course, put their feet up after a life of hard work and be well cared for. But there are plenty of people who are older who are in great health who have energy, zeal, and even ambition, who could at least offer a day a week or even an afternoon. Some could go full time, which is a lot more entertaining than watching loose women and countdown every day. We've completely broken the economy with the failed measures of the last couple of years to control a virus. So that means we need help from the older population to get the economy going again. It's been reported in the paper today that the government are thinking of bringing forward changes to the state pension. Having to work until you're 68 could now be brought forward by several years. A slap in the face to some who have worked hard for their retirement, but an opportunity for many who would actually rather get out there and keep themselves active and stimulated in the workplace rather than being sat at home wishing their life away. Plenty of older family members and friends of mine have worked well into old age and it's kept them stimulated and young and it's been good for society and the economy as well as their mental and physical health. I look at the friends that we have on this show, the likes of the green goddess, broadcaster Diana Moran and radio legend Diddy David Hamilton, working well past 80 still on the radio every day and arguably doing his best work. I make a point of having older, brilliant voices on my show. That's what I call diversity. So it's my view, if you're an oldie, you're a goldie. You have so much more to give, and I think any employer would be mad not to take you. I've had enough of old people in this country being told you're tired. It's time they were told you're hired instead. What's your reaction? EasyJet uh, seeking older cabin crew from 45 right up until the 60s. Mark at GBNews.UK. I'll get to your emails shortly reacting to my big opinion and all of the big stories of today, the day, in tonight's show. We've got Deputy Leader of UKIP, Rebecca Jane. Olympic legend and broadcaster Chris Akabusi and political commentator Albi Amancona. Uh, Albi, welcome back to the show. How the devil are you? Very well, Mark. All, all the better for seeing you. How are you doing? I'm really well and I'm very excited about this story because when I do the big opinion monologue, I'm always looking for a good news story and at last I found one. 
You most certainly have, and I think it's a really timely news story, actually, because if we look at one of the big issues that we have in the UK economy at the moment, it's that we've got a labour shortage. But one of the things that has happened as a result of COVID-19 is we have about 630,000 working-age people who are out of work now who weren't out of work before the pandemic. And a lot of these people are in that over-45 age bracket, so we're seeing a lot of businesses, not just EasyJet, looking at how we can tap into this resource of work that we have to try and plug this labour force gap that we have with something else other than migration. Well, that's right. And Albie, of course, you can't expect somebody in their 70s uh, to work, uh, you know, I don't know, digging, digging roads or something. But there are plenty of office-based jobs and plenty of roles in retail and hospitality that would suit the older population. Precisely. I mean, if you actually look at where most of the labour shortages are, we are looking at things like retail, we are looking at things like hospitality, social care, careers which are actually quite well suited to people, perhaps in, in middle age or in later age. Um, so there's definitely a lot of space in the economy for older people to be working. It's not just a young man's world anymore. Uh, yes, Chris Akabusi, my mother, went back into nursing much later in life. It works. Yeah, so I'm really, this is really good news because uh, I actually do represent this demographic. I will be 64 next week huh? and it's great to know that there's work for me out there. Um, you don't look a day over 40. How do you do it? You, What's you your secret? You took so long, I was waiting for that straight away, my friend. <laughs> is, it, is it Vaseline on the lens? <laughs> the cameraman you was giving a hard time, he works wonders for me, mate. Don't worry yeah. about that. You must be out of focus. It's like, it's like, it's like Angela Lansbury on, uh, on Murder, She Wrote. But, but anyway, look, happy birthday. You look incredible and you haven't given up your career and you won't be doing so anytime soon. Chris? No, def de definitely not. I mean, I look forward to working well into my 70s and 80s mm. if I'm still around. Um, look, we've got a reverse de uh, demographic bubble now, so there are much more people in the 30s, 40s, 50s than there are in the 10s, 20s and, mm. and 30s. So we have got to make sure, and like you said in your monologue, um, with the economy and the way it's gone and the, the Chancellor and the way he's loaded us with taxes, we're going to have to work for longer. Um, 68 now is when you're going to retire, whereas when I was a young person, people were looking to retire in their 60s, in, in the early 60s. Um, I'm happy to work longer. It's already been said, retail requires uh, more people, as well as hospitality. And what you do get when you get people of my sort of demographic, you have got that worldly wise, been there, seen that, done, got the T-shirt. You would hope to think that when there were challenges going around at the workspace. We've got the breadth of our experience to draw on to know how to handle any given situation. Um, I was interested in what you said that you know, sort of with the broadcasters that are being let go of mm. very, very early. And I do understand, again, you do need new blood that come into any sort of industry. And with the way that things have gone with the AI and technology, I suspect that the millennium generation do have a competitive advantage in that arena. But when it comes to service, when it comes to, to, to management, when it comes to sort of strategic thinking, you've got this wealth of information over 40 years to be able to bring into any given community. Rebecca Jane, older people, lots of viewers of my show tonight, an untapped resource for our economy. Absolutely. I think it's a, such a good idea. I love it. Um, I think I actually want to do it when I get to that age and my kids have all gone. I want to go and fly around the world. Um, sounds great. Uh, I also i am going to agree, obviously, with Chris and say that um, obviously, this is a service industry, and for me, some of the people that have the absolute best service skills are those older generations, and absolutely, they need to be passing down more of, of that information and that wealth of knowledge to our younger generations who <laughs> struggle, I believe, uh, with service. And, you know, I, I've been in many a hospitality place and you get a plate of food shoved in front of you. Let's bring back some of our old-style traditional values, and I think that this is one really good way of doing that. Yeah, uh, amen to that. So I'll get to your emails shortly, mark at gbnews.uk. Uh, coming up later this hour in the news agenda, a new male pill has been announced, but can men be trusted with contraception? Ladies, what do you think about that? Mark at gbnews.uk. 
But next in the big question, uh, following, uh, I'm afraid, several awful attacks and indeed a lot of fouling on the streets, <laughs> is it time for dogs to be kept on a lead when they're out of the house? We'll discuss that with a top vet, a top animal behaviourist and someone that adopts doggies. Uh, we'll debate dogs next. See you in two. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's about standards and public life. No, I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, Narendra. I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GV News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Well, a big reaction to my big opinion monologue. EasyJet are going to recruit cabin crew who are 45 and older, well into their 60s. I think this is fantastic news. It's time for workplaces to have more grey power. But let's get to your feedback, mark at gbnews.uk. And uh, look, such fascinating uh, responses across the board. David says, Mark, hire older people and younger people, a mix of skills and experience. I worked at a supermarket alongside an elderly ex-military guy when I was a student. He wanted to work as he watched his ex-military colleagues die of boredom. He was fantastic for the service he gave, fantastic to me, as he was so motivating. David, what a lovely email. Janice says, Mark, my hubby is 84 and still looks after our garden. His job was horticulture, so it isn't hard work. Well done, Janice. You keep that man on his knees and keep him digging and weeding and fertilising. I'm very pleased uh, to hear that, uh, uh, that he's got the garden on the go, Janice. Well done, you. Uh, Jeremy says, uh, Mark, I'm 63, and if I got a job tomorrow, my tax and national insurance rate combined would be 72%. Not encouraging. Um, how about this from Malcolm? May I suggest, Mark, that we emphasise elders, 
not older people. That's more respectful and encourages the construct that elders have immense contributions to offer. In Japan, elders are respected for their knowledge, skills and experience. Uh, well said. Uh, Jax says, hi, Mark. Lucky you, knowing people in lively, interesting jobs and continuing to work past retirement. What about those of us in boring drudgery? affecting our health, both mental and physical, wage slaves forever until we drop. Jackie, thank you for balancing the debate. I'll get to more of your brilliant emails shortly, but it's time now for this. Yes, it's time for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. Tonight, a man threatened to rip a woman's head off after she asked him to put his dog on a lead. Donna Hewitt says she's now too scared to walk her pet in York after she was verbally attacked and spat at by a man who was walking two dogs with his daughter. Last year, the woman's dog, Holly, was attacked by another dog that was off its lead, leaving her needing eight staples in her throat. Well, I'm so glad that Holly is feeling better, but this story follows a campaign launched in Wiltshire to keep dogs on leads in various outside spaces in order to control fouling and to protect the safety of children and other animals. So it begs the question, should dogs be kept on a lead at all times when out in public? To debate this, I'm delighted uh, to welcome several expert voices. Uh, first of all, uh, which Zoe have we got? OK, so let's speak to dog behaviourist and founder of Best Behaviour Dog Training, Zoe uh, Willingham, uh, owner of uh, The Friendly Pet Nurse, and dog lover and animal activist Kerry Waters. Uh, first of all, Zoe Willingham, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, what do you think to the idea of dogs being kept on the lead at all times when they're out and about? Um, personally, I don't think they need to be on lead all the time, but I did create an awareness day called Dog on a Lead Day because I do think there is a time and a place when dogs should be on a lead. Um, dogs need to be on a lead when they're not trained to be off the lead, um, if they don't recall, if they don't have an emergency stop behaviour. Um, you know, sometimes dogs need to be on lead because they're going through a rehab programme or maybe they just haven't got their full training yet. So there are times and places where they need to be on a lead. And I do think it's really important that other dog owners respect that um, and that there's this mutual respect between dog owners when that's required. Uh, Kerry Waters, uh, you're a dog lover and an animal activist. I understand that you adopt dogs, is that right? Yes, exactly. Um, I adopt dogs um, who have um, different behavioural issues, mainly their dogs that have been left in refuges for a long time. And I completely agree with Zoe. Um, you, dogs don't need to be um, on the lead at all times, but particularly um, in traffic, um, it's for the dog's own safety as well. No matter how much you train your dog, they're individuals and you never know if something's going to trigger them to run into traffic. Um, but when it comes as well to um, open spaces like fields, for example, if you know that your dog hasn't got good recall, and they run up to other dogs. If they run up to my dogs in particular, it doesn't matter how friendly your dog is. My dogs are in training and they often have triggers where they are aggressive towards other dogs. So it's always important to bear in mind that um, if someone asks you to put your dog on a lead, it's not because they think your dog's a bad dog. It's just because we want to ensure the safety of everyone. I'm delighted to say we're now joined by a vet and it is, uh, it is Zoe Blake. Hi, Zoe. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, and thank you so much for being Good. on the show. I just wonder whether if there was a simple rule that dogs are always kept on a lead, we wouldn't have had that terrible story of uh, Holly and her owner in York. I mean, I agree with totally with what the other two are saying, that if you haven't got a good recall, then you shouldn't really be letting your dog off. Um, the problem is I think we're faced with quite a lot more dog owners now who maybe aren't as experienced um, and they take dogs on and they don't quite realise the commitment it takes for training and repetition. And it's not just a puppy thing. It has to continue the whole way through its life. And certainly on a work scenario, we do often see, you know, dogs that have been attacked. Um, you don't often know the full story, but often it can be dogs on a lead. Other dogs have approached the dog on a lead and therefore the dog 
retaliates because it can't get away. Um, and if they're fearful, like with us in any situation, you might then obviously retaliate. Um, and sometimes it's not the dog's fault. Uh, Zoe Willingham, um, I completely agree with what Zoe there had to say about not demonising the dogs themselves. And we know that there aren't really bad dogs, are there? Just bad owners that have neglected their pets. Um, but how about a blanket ban on dogs running around in parks? Because that's where you've got children, that's where you've got pensioners, and that's where you've got other small dogs and other small animals that could be vulnerable to attack. I agree to a point. Um, I actually think that councils and local um, outside spaces do need to allow dogs to have specific areas. Um, I think if you've got a well-trained dog, it's fine. It, you know, that dog is probably well socialised, can probably be around people, probably around other dogs. However, I also think as well, if we want to be ultra safe around children, because often, you know, dogs are walked where there are small, tiny children. If you want to be ultra safe, let's, let's have separate areas. Let's have a dog area and a, and a child area. Um, there's no reason why we can't do that. And, you know, there's lots of dog walking fields available in the UK now where people with dogs can go and hire a field. It doesn't cost very much. And it's a great bit of freedom for our dogs to be off the lead. Um, I also think as well, we have to remember that dogs can have really great lives walking on a lead. It doesn't have to be doom and gloom for those dogs that are walking on a lead. They can still go and sniff. You can do fun things together. You can do training together. You can even do some like doggy parkour exercises and just have a lot of fun and a lot of bond together. You know, at the end of the day, none of us get a dog just to let it off a lead and be on our phone. We, we've got a dog to have as our companion. So let's treat that dog that way when we take them out for walks, whether they're on or off lead let's focus on them and do fun things together and you know we can actually make a really positive out of this um do the training do the fun stuff together and we can have a mix of on and off lead and we can all live in harmony we don't have to have these situations where you know dogs are getting themselves into trouble it just comes down to being responsible and just doing that training really and having that commitment to training uh, the problem is, Zoe Willingham, you are the founder of Best Behaviour Dog Training. I know you do a brilliant job for dogs and their owners, uh, but most owners are the problem and they all think that their pets are perfectly trained. I, yeah, I think there are some that perhaps do think that, but I get, I, I train over 200 dogs a week and those those 200 dogs coming to us just locally that's just the local ones um you know they come to us because they know there is something to learn and there is something to do with their dogs um but i agree with you, you know it's, it's a small percentage of owners in the uk overall that actually formally train their dogs um some people do it at home some people don't do anything at all and i agree you know i think we do need to raise awareness of people you know the benefits of doing training with your dog and, and actually being responsible because training isn't just about doing sits and downs it's about training a life skill for a dog but it's also about training responsible dog ownership we're training the people as much as we're training the dogs yeah too right uh, so you train about 200 dogs a week how many uh cookie treats do you get through a week for the dogs we get through loads of treats. So all of our stuff is reward-based training. So we get through lots and lots of treats and the dogs never say no to that. But it's such a, a lovely way to train because um, it, the dogs love it. We love it. And it's, it's, it's a doggy payday for them. They love it. It's, they, they do the work. They get paid for it. So it's really enjoyable. Um, Kerry Waters, uh, let's talk about the relationship between the owner and the dog and how is that enhanced by the owner being able to let the dog off the lead. I grew up with German Shepherd Alsatians and I used to take them to, to a big sort of park. It was a kind of very rough, uncultivated park. And that moment when I let Rusty or Callum uh, off the lead, they just, you know, obviously ran for the hills and it was, it was always a joy to behold. I guess we wouldn't want to deprive dogs of that moment of freedom that they crave so much. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the times the dogs who come to me, they're often they have problems because they don't have that mental stimulation. I mean, I have border collies in, at the moment and they just want to run. Um, and I find that actually the most sort of like fulfilling part of my day, are that, that's, that's Shelley and then the black ones, Jay. Gorgeous. Uh, the most fulfilling part day yes he's going for a run with them and and it really does build that relationship and you'll find that um a lot of the training can be sort of um 
it's kind of built on um, with the sort of the mental exercises and the stimulation and the just just wearing the dog out. So, so dogs just want to have a purpose, I think. And yeah, I think as Zoe said, positive reinforcement, reward-based training, that all in combination will will mean that you have a really happy, healthy pup. Yeah, to your right. Uh, speaking of healthy, uh, of course, Zoe Blake, you are the vet. Is there an impact on the health of the dog if they spend their life on a lead? I think obviously obesity is growing in the dog population like it is, you know, generally across the board. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say being on a lead influences that to you know, a certain degree. My dog stays on a lead quite a lot because he's a deer chaser and obviously I don't want that to be happening. So, um, but he is definitely not overweight. I just have to walk further. Um, so it's obviously good fitness for me. So yeah, it sort of helps in that respect. But health wise, I mean, it's good mental stimulation. Every time a dog is exercised, it's stimulated mentally. Um, and as a dog get, gets older, um, shorter, more frequent walks are better. It's good for you. It's, you know, it's fitness, it's getting you outside. Um, so I think, you know, responsible dog ownership, you know, can really be carried the way from puppyhood right the way through to when they're old age. And it's yeah, uh, good for fitness. Wise advice. Uh, Zoe Blake, thank you for joining us. Owner of The Friendly Pet Nurse. My thanks to the other Zoe, Zoe Willingham, who is the <laughs> founder of Best Behaviour Dog Training. And my thanks to animal activist and dog lover, Kerry Waters. Kerry, let me tell you, I've got some proper dog envy going on. Um, let, uh, let me know your thoughts on this. Should dogs be kept on a lead whenever they're out of the house? Mark at gbnews.uk. Uh, coming up, we've got lots more to get through, um, including the new male pill has been announced. Apparently, it's very effective. I'll be giving you the science behind it shortly. But can men be trusted with contraception? See you in two. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let well, him finish. Don't it be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. 
At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Uh, lots more to get through, and I'm delighted to say, reacting to the big stories of the day, we've got the ex, uh, what is she, ex-commentator and lawyer. She's the deputy <laughs> leader of UKIP. She's a very busy lady. It's Rebecca Jane. Uh, we have Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi and the wonderful political commentator Albi Amancona. Now, scientists have come up with a new version of the male pill, but it requires injecting a gel into your abdomen. How many boys will be up for that? Uh, previously, male pill solutions have been undermined by side effects, but researchers believe they finally have a solution which is long-lasting but not permanent. Rather than hormones to halt sperm production, the contraceptive involves a gel which is injected into the tubes that carry sperm. I've got to say, I feel like a biology teacher at this moment in time. <laughs> the gel, which is not yet available to the public, will then block sperm from travelling to the testicles. I think we might be entering the realms of too much information here. However, let me add that after around two years, the gel dissolves and men can opt to have the procedure done again. It's being called the IUD for men. It all sounds quite grisly, but it begs the question, can men be trusted with contraception? Only one person to ask, and that's Rebecca Jane. Absolutely not. Really? <laughs> so let's say you're in a romantic clinch with a young man, a very eligible bachelor, OK, and, and he says, don't worry, RJ, I'm protected. I've had the jab, and he doesn't mean COVID. Ugh. Listen, you're talking to somebody that's got control issues, so I'm going to prefer to do it myself rather than trust anybody else, regardless of whatever the gender is. Um, I also don't think that many women can be trusted with contraception. I think that we just all have to take responsibility for ourselves and we can't rely on anybody else to do anything. What a cynical view, wasn't that? No, but it's such a sexist world where yeah. even with a breakthrough in terms of male contraception, most women will say, no. I wouldn't trust him. No. No, no, sorry. You, you know, you are all a bit unreliable. It's, it's really unfair. It's the same reason that I emptied the dishwasher really badly. so that Because you don't want to do it yeah, again. So Mrs Dolan's just like, I'll do that, because at least I'll do it properly, which is, of course, my cunning plan. But, uh, you know, <laughs> and it's but... worked beautifully. <laughs> but now she's, now she's heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> Although, unfortunately, I'm rubbish at a few other things too, which comes at a price. Akabusi, yes, can sir. men be trusted with contraception? I wouldn't trust myself. <laughs> Especially after but, a but, couple of sherbets. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I, 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 I'm fortunately at the state in my age that I don't think that I would be um, intimate with anybody of fertile scenario, so that isn't my point. Never say never, I can be seen. <laughs> There's always the GB News Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I wouldn't want to be trusted with that scenario because when push comes to shove, although I well, might... Well, I think be... that's part of it, is push come to shove. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's involved. Uh, uh, although I might be required you push to... first, then you <laughs> <laughs> You're being very, very <laughs> naughty being today. I'm going to so much trouble. <laughs> what have they put in my tea? It's, it's because I've had the contraceptive jab. <laughs> And it's affected oh. my hormones. But it could cost you a lot of money if you get it wrong. I yeah. mean, I mean, the, 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 if the lady herself has would have a baby to carry around, yeah. and you're going to have to pay for the next 18 years. So, uh, no, I wouldn't go there. But That'll you be. see, you, you, talk, you spoke about hormones there, Mark. I think the great thing about this contraceptive is it actually doesn't involve any hormones at all. Yes. And you speak to a lot of women, young women, who take things like the pill or have IUDs, and they have these hormones pumped into them for mm. 20, Correct. 30 years of their lives, and then they might find, find they have fertility issues when they go to have children. So, actually, I think this is a really important mm. medical development. It allows men to take responsibility for something which is equally a man's responsibility as it is a woman. So a man could take that personal responsibility and say, I am going to protect myself from potentially impregnating a woman. So I think this is a great breakthrough. But then you have got the issue with um, the, um, protecting yourself in a way from STDs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so it's not great news for the safe sex message, is no, it? No, exactly. And... Um, I'm not quite sure whether blocking the tubes 
to um, withhold the sperm also then affects the functionality, mm. um, you know, lastbit.com. And um, because you, you, it's not the same if that's not happening. Yes. You know what I'm talking so about. So you're yeah? wondering about whether you can fly that Olympic Ejaculate. flag. Yeah, yeah, whether, yeah yes. whether the flame is going to go out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you've got a torch in your hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, oh. think, I think the flame would still go out because when people get vasectomies, <laughs> yes, they still, flames still, still go out. I mean, is that yeah. going to be the new chat up line, Albie, in nightclubs? Do you still get nightclubs, by the way? Yes, of course. <laughs> Can you tell? I haven't been out for a while. Uh, at the discotheque. You signed up yeah. someone again. Have you, have you had the yeah. jab? Well, exactly. And it's going to be like, uh, don't of worry, I've had pill. my tubes filled. You'll be fine, uh, darling. Well, maybe. Well, to be honest, as a gay man, I've got absolutely no skin in this game whatsoever. <laughs> to be quite frank, I'm glad of it because I wouldn't want this injection myself. But the point is, I still think this is great. I've got two sisters at home that are on the pill and they all have had IUDs, yeah. various types of contraceptives, and they really hate being on them. So I think if this is an option for men to take that personal responsibility, I think that's a good thing. My fantastic panel return very shortly because they'll be responding to my take at 10. Uh, ridiculous story. Story, Waitrose, which, by the way, is a supermarket I love. It's a great British supermarket. Uh, they did a lovely ad campaign featuring two farmers comparing their suntans. Well, people are worried about skin cancer and they've had to edit scenes out of the advert. Seriously, what is the world coming to? I'll be reacting to that in my take at 10 very, very shortly with full panel reaction. Plus, we've got tomorrow's papers live from 10.20, which is 10 minutes earlier than everyone else in the company of the former editor of the Sunday Mirror, Paul Conyu. Um, but next up, we're going live to the United States and the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield, uh, with quite dramatic and exclusive news about the queen's final months and Donald Trump and his aim to get back into the White House. See you shortly. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Great news, the EasyJet are going to recruit people who are 45 and older into their 60s as cabin crew. I think there's huge potential tapping into the grey power that exists within our economy. Should we do more to get older people back to the workplace if they want to? A big reaction to this. Alan uh, has uh, tweeted the following. Uh, Mark, I love your optimism, but doubt many public employees who retire, retire in their 50s with a good pension will give up their holiday life. Laurie says, Mark, when I was retiring from the police service, uh, there was a deliberate policy of discarding experienced police officers for younger university-led recruits. This created a situation where young recruits did not gain from the experience of seasoned police officers on the streets. The result is the dire lack of common sense and experience that we have today in the police service. And the woke agenda reigns. Uh, that is Laurie. Well, Laurie, thank you for your email and thank you for the service that you've given this country as a top cop. And last but not least on this, uh, Christina has said, Dear Mark, I tried to get a job washing up in a small hotel in Bex Hill, the Northern Hotel, but was told I'm too old at 67. At 67, you're a baby. Um, ha uh, the person uh, that I spoke to said he needed young European staff but they'd all gone back home since Brexit. Too old to wash up. Christine, that is an outrage. And to me, you sound like a natural scrubber. Uh, keep those emails coming. Mark at gbnews.uk. It's time now for US News with the queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Hi, Kinsey. Mark, how lucky are you that you got to sit next to RJ for an entire hour? Honestly, she she is our queen. She's nearly as glamorous as you as well. Um, Kinsey, listen, let's talk about Kanye West, who has some rather lofty ambitions. Tell me more. You know, to be honest with you, Mark, um, you and I having this discussion right now is much more than any of the United States media are giving this story. I think that they are really kind of sick and tired of Ye and they've shut him in a corner and they and they don't they're not taking him seriously, which, to be frank with you, I, I think is probably the best situation right now. Kanye West announcing his 2024 bid for uh, to become the president of the United States. Our country used to be one of the greatest in the world, and now it seems to be um, a clown show. Uh, but um, he recently sat down at Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump uh, to see if he would. He offered him the vice president position. Donald Trump apparently was angered by this, rejected Kanye's offer, and immediately released a statement distin distancing himself from the controversial rapper. So like I said, no one really is taking this seriously. I think a lot of us are kind of exhausted looking for, you know, I hate to quote Obama. That's the last thing I ever thought I'd do, but we are looking for hope and change in the United States. And I, I don't think that um, Kanye West is going to bring uh, that in a positive way. No, it, it doesn't sound so. Uh, a new book is out, and it's about the Queen, our wonderful, much-loved Queen Elizabeth II, uh, written by a royal admirer and a legendary British broadcaster, Giles Brandreth. And it's been quite a revealing new biography, hasn't it? Oh, is he just not the most precious? I had him on my podcast recently, and I wanted to just, I wanted to move in with him. I wanted to wake up every day, say, hi, Giles, how, how, what, what's for breakfast? I mean, he's amazing. Um, you know, I think that this gives us real insight into the Queen's relationship with Harry and Meghan towards the end of her life, Mark, because we didn't know, we were finding out um, that the Queen towards the end of her life was suffering in silence through um, from bone marrow cancer, okay? Now, ha would Harry and Meghan 
really decline their last invitation to spend time with her if they knew that she was suffering from cancer? I certainly would hope not. Or perhaps the family didn't think that they could trust them with that information. It, you know, it really makes you start to question their relationship with the queen. Here in the United States, Harry goes on television and talks about how incredibly close they are and how he's trying to protect her from certain members of, of, of the staff or family. And, and I think in reality, we're realizing that there was a, a real divide here, um, but it's a very charming book. He's an incredible writer, talks about how the queen thought James Bond movies got too loud. <laughs> you know, most recent ones were too loud. And it's going to be an incredible read. It's called um, uh, The Queen, An Intimate Portrait, and it is a must have, comes out in December. Yeah, looking forward to it. I think we've got some pictures of the Queen in her pomp. Um, the bottom line is that another revelation from the book is that the Queen battled ill health, and we obviously we know she'd been poorly for a long time, but she didn't show just how much she was suffering. Absolutely not. No, Mark. And I mean, she, like she promised, she worked until her last day. And I think it just gives us a better understanding of what a true re leadership looks like and how to define true leadership. Megan talked about suffering in silence. I mean, look at Queen Elizabeth. Very few of us knew about um, her ill health. We just thought she was getting older or, uh, you know, we just we, we, it was a mystery to us because she continued to show up. She continued to work. And Giles actually talks in the book about how she pushed herself almost too far and how doctors had to step in and say, we really think you need to take a step back because you're actually exhausting yourself. But internally, she wanted to keep going. She wanted to stay out in front of everybody and she she wanted to continue to do her job. And now the Oscars is the great showbiz event of the year. You've also got the Emmys as well. And we have an actress who's suggesting that the awards should be gender neutral. So you would lose best actor and best actress and it would just be best actor of no particular gen uh, gender. Is that right? Now, Mark, I have to give Emma Corrin some slack here because BBC specifically asked her this question, or I should say, specifically asked them because she goes by the pronouns they them so i correct myself but bbc specifically asked them this question and they responded yes it would be nice if that we could create more of an, a welcoming space but I, I really don't have an opinion on this. I don't care. This is a foreign world to me. It was Jerry Seinfeld that recently said award shows are horse, and I'm going to use the word feces, but that's not the word he used. Uh, he's, he's also referred to them as a joke in the past. It, these award shows used to be magical to us, Mark, because we had no access to these people unless we paid the money to go sit in a movie theater and watch them. Now we have too much access to them, thanks to social media. We know what they ate. We know what they did last weekend. And th the magic is gone. So do whatever you want to do at the award shows, because guess what? We're not watching them. There you go. They've lost the dressing room. And more devastatingly, they have lost Kinsey Schofield. Uh, well, England did not lose to America, but it was a bore draw, as it's described in this country. And uh, I understand that the comedian James Corden was trending in relation to this game last night. Why so? It's not just, okay, I saw this story, hilarious. It, it, the debate was who has to keep James? And it's a, it, it, we're up in arms over who's going to keep him because it's pretty, it's a, it's a shove, like nobody wants him. But I saw this same conversation trending about Harry and Meghan. Uh, but no, <laughs> I, they, it, the big debate is who has to keep James if uh, they lose. And um, I'm going to, I, I don't know. I know Dan Wooten's a fan, so maybe, maybe he can move into Dan, Dan's guest house. Mm, yeah, well, that's not a bad shout. Uh, listen, Kinsey, a great debrief on the week's big stories. We'll see you in a week's time. The queen of US showbiz royal and political reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Check out her excellent royal website, To Die For Daily, or find Kinsey Schofield on Twitter, an absolute must follow. Uh, lots to get through. In my take at 10, I'm sick of everyone getting offended all the time. Are you? I'll be dealing with that next. Uh, plus, we've got tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.20. That is 10 minutes earlier than everyone else in the company of the former editor of the Sunday Mirror, Paul Conyu. Plus, we've got full panel reaction as well. Uninterrupted papers from 10.20 to 11. And it's the Sunday papers and lots of big political stories are breaking. See you shortly.
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 pm on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's about standards and public life. No, I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, Mirinda. I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, traveling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online, across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 o'clock. Welcome to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night Inn. In my take at 10 in just a moment, are you sick of everyone being offended by everything? After Waitrose cut scenes from an advert with farmers comparing suntans. A harmless joke, you'd think, but apparently not. I'll be dealing with that in just a couple of minutes. And in the news agenda with my panel, as Primark and Poundland open a load of new stores, are cheap shops just as good? And as a man meets the king, King Charles, in plastic sandals, is it time to rock the Crocs? Now, what do you think about uh, footwear? How important are the shoes you have on your feet? Plus, tomorrow's papers live and uninterrupted, 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, right through until 11. And it's, of course, the Sunday papers with some big political stories. First up, the headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Thank you, Mark. Yes, Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. The head of the London Fire Brigade says firefighters who are found to have bullied colleagues who have been racist, misogynistic or homophobic will be sacked. Andy Rowe has promised a zero-tolerance approach after an independent review found a toxic culture within the service. Accounts in the report ranged from a black firefighter who had a noose placed by his locker to women being groped and people having their helmets filled with urine. The review was commissioned after a trainee firefighter took his own life in 2020. We're going to conduct a five-year case review, so we look back across all those cases, those terrible behaviours, those examples of bullying and harassment, uh, which have been considered before in NFB, 
uh, and put them back through that externally accredited process. And I do expect some people to be dismissed as a result. We will become the first service in the country to wear body-worn video cameras to ensure both the safety of our own staff and, and, and to reassure the public. So those are examples of what we're doing immediately. A woman's died and around 10 people are missing following landslides caused by heavy rains on the Italian island of Ischia near Naples. The mudslides cut through a port town, engulfing buildings and sweeping homes and cars into the sea. Dozens of people are reportedly stranded inside homes and hotels, cut off from rescue teams who continue to search for victims. The Met Office says rain and strong winds are expected to continue across southern England and Wales over the weekend. The yellow alert in those parts of the UK runs until 3am tomorrow. Uh, buses and trains are likely to be affected uh, in addition to the knock-on effect from today's rail strikes. Protests against coronavirus restrictions have erupted in China in response to the deaths of 10 people in an apartment fire linked to a lockdown. Demonstrators in the city of Urumqi claim efforts to rescue residents were hampered by anti-COVID measures. Now, restrictions have been in place there since August. They are some of the most draconian lockdowns in the country. Earlier today, China reported a record number of coronavirus cases for a third consecutive day, putting further pressure on the President Xi Jinping's zero-COVID policy. Former Scotland Rugby Union International Doddy Weir has died at the age of 52. Weir was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in December 2016. He won 61 caps for his country and was selected for the successful British and Irish Lions tour to South Africa in 1997. The Prince and Princess of Wales have paid tribute to the rugby legend, describing him as a hero and saying his tireless efforts to raise awareness of MND have been an inspiration. And that is it. It for the moment you're up to date. It is back now to Mark Dolan tonight. Thanks, Aaron. This is Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. It's five minutes past ten and lots to get through. In my take at ten in just a moment. Are you sick of everyone being offended by everything after Waitrose? Cut scenes from an advert with farmers comparing suntans. A harmless joke, you'd think, but apparently not. I'll be dealing with that in just a moment. And in the news agenda with my panel, as Primark and Poundland open a load of new stores, are cheap shops just as good? I've got to tell you, I'm a massive fan. And as a man meets the king, King Charles in plastic sandals, is it time to rock the Crocs? Now, what do you think about footwear? What are the do's and don'ts? Tackling all of those stories are my very well-dressed panel tonight of Deputy Leader of UKIP, Rebecca Jane, Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi, and political commentator Albie Amancona. And I'll be asking to see all of their shoes. Plus, tomorrow's papers live and uninterrupted, 10 minutes earlier than everyone else at 10.20, in the company of the former editor of the Sunday Mirror, a good friend of mine, Paul Conyu. So that's the papers from 10.20 right through until 11.00. But first, my take at 10. You won't believe this. Another day, another company shamed into a U-turn because somebody was offended. The excellent British supermarket Waitrose have removed a scene from an advert about their brilliant farmers, which referenced the suntan that they'd got from working in the fields all day. Predictably, a handful of campaigners wrote to the advertising complaints watchdog saying that this was an irresponsible advert in relation to people getting skin cancer. Is this really where we are now? That you can't even have a jokey reference to sunburn without someone being triggered. Waitrose have even apologised. Stop apologising! You're feeding the monster of these armchair autocrats! Apologising for doing absolutely nothing wrong is the epitome of where we are in 2022. In the end, if you try to make adverts or TV shows or films or songs or stand-up routines that don't offend anyone, you'll be left in a joyless abyss where nobody says anything interesting about anything. We now live in an era of the perpetually offended. 
The George Orwell novel 1984 now comes with a trigger warning, simply in case people are uncomfortable with its content, which is all about a dystopian world that these thin-skinned idiots are actually creating. The Beatles documentary on Disney Plus came with a warning that people would be smoking in the course of the film. This is progress, is it? As a society, we're being turned into a generation of intolerant, closed-minded, reactionary numpties. If it carries on like this, creators won't generate any work of value for fear of offending any number of interest groups. I think we should be more offended, not less. It's good for people to feel a bit uncomfortable from time to time. Who knows, rather than threaten your very existence, dangerous, triggering material might actually be good for you. I'm triggered by all of those who are triggered, and I'm offended by all of those that are offended non-stop, 24-7. Get on with it, grow a pair, and get over yourself. You can take your fragile worldview and you can shove it where the sun doesn't shine. And if that offends you, all the better. That means it's job done. Uh, let me know your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.uk. We now live in an era of the perpetually offended, and I've had enough. Those people offend me. But what's your view? Mark at gbnews.uk. Let's get the reaction now of my brilliant panel. Uh, we have the deputy leader of UKIP, Rebecca Jane. We have Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi and top political commentator Albi Amancona. Uh, let's start with you, Chris Akabusi. Do you think Waitrose were right to remove this part of the advert? Well, they think that they're right. Their market department have actually bowed to the pressure. But... Um, it seems to me like an infantilisation mm. of the general public. Um, and farmers do work in the field and do get suntans, etc., all year round to ensure that we get from the field to our fork all sorts of produce. Um, and it seems banal to me, although, of course, melanoma and cancers are very serious uh, issues and, you know, we're not sort of advertising sunbeds and, and sun studios, but to articulate and show that farmers who work 365, 24-7 in getting f the stuff from the field to your plate, and you know what, they get a little bit of a tan, um, I, I, I feel sorry that... White Rose felt that they had to bow to that pressure because we're adults, or the majority of people are adults, and can make our own mind up, you know, as to whether we want to follow the farmers and work all day in the sunshine and not put sun, uh, sunscreen on. Yes, and of course, Albie, none of us like skin cancer, but this was just a kind of humorous scene in which these two farmers are comparing suntans because they've been working out in the fields for hours on end. It was a bit of fun, uh, which, of course, now, because of the culture we exist in, is not allowed anymore. Yeah, I saw the scene. It just seemed like a, a bit of fun between two farmers. And, you know, it's absolutely true that farmers do work outside in all different temperatures and they're going to get a skin tan and sometimes they're going to be cold and sometimes they're going to be hot and sometimes they're going to be sweaty and sometimes they're going to be dry. You know, that's just what it's like working outside. So I do think we need to get a sense of, you know, a proportion here. But equally, I think actually having read the article, a lot of the people who were complaining about this advert on Twitter were actually people that had suffered from skin cancer themselves. So they had very personal stories as to why they maybe felt particularly particularly offended by, by, by this advert. I think Waitrose are probably a bit ham-fisted with this, bit over the top, pulling the advert scene entirely. Um, I think they co probably could have found a better way to resolve this and the people really shouldn't have been getting too offended. Well, I think, Albie, that they should have stood their ground because you can have campaigns and you should have campaigns in which you warn people about sun exposure and you encourage people to wear sunscreen, which I do, uh, which my kids do, of course. And there's a time and a place. But here's an advert where two characters are, you know, and they're, of course, real farmers talking about their suntan. And I just worry, Albie, that this is the thin end of the wedge, that whenever anyone writes a joke, they write a sitcom, they write a book, they write a song, they've got to second guess what the reaction might be. 
Precisely. And I honestly, Mark, I don't know how we got to this point, how we've become such a nation of softies, in a way, mm. that we get offended by people joking about a suntan on a Waitrose Christmas advert. It's all just gone a bit mad. I think we all just need to get our great British sense of common sense back. You're too right. Uh, Rebecca Jane, I don't know if you remember, you're far too young, actually, that episode of Only Fools and Horses when Rodney falls asleep under a sunbed and when he wakes up, he's completely sunburnt. I mean, his face is absolutely blistered. It's one of the funniest moments in the history of that series. OK. Yeah, too young. <laughs> 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 that was a burn, but not a sunburn. Um, you know what? <clears throat> Somebody is always going to be offended by something somewhere. If I say the sky is blue, some people will be like, no, it's a shade of whatever. I couldn't care less. Get over it and move on. Um, Twitter is an absolute cesspool of people of offence and it just has to stop. And how did we get in this position? We got in this position by allowing it. We got in this position by Waitrose pulling the advert. Stop it. What happened to having a decent conversation? If people want to highlight an issue that it's brought up for them, triggered, do. Talk about it. Talk about, you know, sunbeds. Talk about skin cancer. Talk about everything. But don't get offended by it. Don't pull the advert. And do you know what, Waitrose? I'd have thought a lot more highly of you if you'd have donated a percentage of your profits towards a skin cancer charity rather than pulling an advert and bowing down to pure nonsense. Yeah, I mean, in fairness to, to Waitrose, they just took out that part of the advert. Mm. And Waitrose do a hell of a lot in the community. Plus... Uh, they actually, you know, are supplied by excellent farmers and it's dairy and it's great meat and all the rest of it. So, you know, they, in my view, have got no case to answer, but they're victims uh, of this frenzied, hysterical atmosphere, Albi Amancona, in which they'd rather act than get in trouble. Um, we saw that story this week, I don't know if you caught it, Albi, of a theatre company in Sheffield have pulled their production because the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield are going to have Miss Zygon. And uh, they've said that Miss Zygon is uh, apparently misogynistic, it's quite racist, and it's essentially a very, very bad musical to be showing. But this, I'll be a musical that generations of people of all backgrounds have been enjoying for decades. Yeah, I, I think we, we've got to let artistic licence thrive in this country. And there are a lot of pieces of art nowadays that we look at, we, we, that we judge with today's sure, standards, sure. when they're actually decades old. Um, and we look, at, we look at shows like, for example, things like the, the Book of Mormon, you know, hilariously offensive, but it's one of the most popular shows on the West End. We've got to let artists, whether or not they are musicians, whether or not they are actors, whether they're playwrights, whether they're authors like J.K. Rowling, get on with their jobs of entertaining the nation without being too worried about offending people. Uh, too right. Amen to that. Well, listen, no-one's cancelling Albi Amancona, Chris Akabusi or Rebecca Jane. They dare not. I'm delighted to say that this brilliant trio return at 10.30 sharp with the papers. That's right. Uh, we've got your first look at tomorrow's papers and we get a sneaky preview with the former editor of the Sunday Mirror, Paul Conyu, after this. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's about standards and public life. No, I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, Mirinda. I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. 
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Well, a big reaction to my take at 10. Waitrose, which is a supermarket I love very much. I think they do a brilliant job. They, they uh, have so much good quality British produce. They look after their farmers, as do Sainsbury's, by the way. Um, then, uh, then they don't have a problem, but they have an advert problem. And in an advert, two farmers are comparing their suntans and campaigners have said this is offensive to those who have had skin cancer. A big reaction on email. Dawn says, uh, well said in your monologue, Mark. It's crazy to complain about adverts. There's some pretty sad people out there. They must be really boring people with nothing better to do than look for something to complain about. Get a life. If we don't like it, we wouldn't watch it. Uh, yes, you do. Don't you have the ultimate control device, which is your remote control? Keith says, hi, Mark. I'm 68 and vividly remember passing a Baptist chapel on my way home from school and reading their wayside pulpit. Um, the message read... It is as unchristian to take offence as to give offence. The message was strong enough to stick with me for more than 50 years. Well, Keith, I'm not sure I'll be around for 50 years, but I think that one will stay with me too. Shall I repeat it in case you missed that? It's brilliant. It is as unchristian to take offence as it is to give it. Bravo, Keith. Um, how about this? Tracy, Mark, I agree with you. The offended can stick it where the sun doesn't shine. If they've had skin cancer, they could still learn to laugh at a joke. Maybe the farmers had sunscreen on every day. They can still compare their tans. And uh, how about this from Huey, who says, Hi, Mark. If the snowflakes are getting upset, you're doing the right thing. They need putting back in, excuse me, in their box. Um, I think that's something we try to do every night here on the show, Huey. So thanks for that email. Keep those coming, Mark, at gbnews.uk. It's time now for a sneaky peek at tomorrow's Sunday papers. Uh, we've got a full roundup at 10.30 with full panel reaction. Uh, but let's now get uh, the first papers as they come in. And let's get reaction from the former editor of the Sunday Mirror, a good friend of mine, Paul Conyu. Hi, Paul. Good evening. Uh, great to have you on the show. Uh, let's have a look at our front pages. Where shall we start, Tom? Let's have the Express. And uh, here is the front page of the Express, literally hot off the press. Forgive the delay, but here it comes. Uh, migrants housed in forces homes. Uh, quite a shocking story there. Plans to move refugees into military units whilst two and a half thousand British veterans are left homeless. OK, we've also got the Sunday Mirror, which is 
Paul's former paper. I'm a celeb exclusive, Jill to score millions, footy star finalist, already a winner as offers flood in. Uh, this is lioness Jill Scott, who has acquitted herself very well on the show and is expected to coin it on her departure. Uh, we've also got The Observer, actually, so let's have a look at that hot off the press. Blow to Brexit as landmark New Deal sees trade slump. The first major free trade agreement signed by Britain after Brexit has been branded a failure after new figures showed exports had fallen since it came into force. Liz Truss signed a historic deal with Japan as Trade Secretary in October 2020. The Observer there casting doubt on its efficacy and its success. And also, police failings, a damning indictment of Tory rule. OK, well, Paul, lots to sink our teeth into there. Um, can we start with that story in the Sunday Express and this crisis in the channel continues to be a major political headache for the Prime Minister. It's, it certainly is, and it also ties in with the Brexit theme as well, of course. Um, Express, you know, very predictably, are strongly supporting Suella Braverman um, on this issue, while we have the contradiction of the Prime Minister and indeed the Chancellor advocating uh, more, not, ille not illegal boat people, but in fact, you know, an increase in migrant numbers. So it's, it's a fascinating scenario. And as the Observer front page is saying, Brexit, you know, Brexit is far from done. Whatever Boris told us, Brexit is a burning issue. Again, at the top of the, of the political agenda, it's going to be in various other papers uh, in the morning, both in the leader columns, the political commentators, um, com columns, and in the news pages. Of course, this was sparked off by last Sunday's Sunday Times, of course, saying that yeah. we were looking for a this type of deal which I'm reliably informed, you know, the Sunday Times were briefed, if not by Jeremy Hunt personally, certainly by somebody very close to the Chancellor, and almost certainly with the full knowledge of the Prime Minister too. So, as I say, Brexit is back at the top of the agenda, the controversy goes on, but certainly it's not going away. And Certainly. I mean, I'm in a strange position here, as you know, Mark, because I'm a strong Remainer, but I was one of the rare pundits who predicted Leave would win the referendum in 2016. Based on my, my rough and ready research in the Red Wall areas, I thought would be decisive. But now, almost two thirds of my original Leave samples say they come into the regrets it category, and the opinion polls now consistently show double-digit margins are now disillusioned with Brexit. So this one isn't, isn't going away. Uh, no, although any idea of reversing that decision is unlikely, given the fact that the potential incoming Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, has said today that he wouldn't accept a Swiss-style arrangement and that free movement was a red line for him as well as rejecting the idea of single market membership or customs union. So love it or hate it, Brexit is here to stay. Well, Labour, I'm, I'm a Labour supporter, as you know, though I mm. sort of left temporarily during the Corbyn era. Who could blame you? But I'm at odds with Keir Starmer here because I think that we are going to need to build bridges. I, it's not the time to talk about another referendum or times of rejoining the EU full, in any full sense. But a lot, most economists and even some Tory MPs now believe that exploring rejoining in some shape or form the single market and the customs union makes economic sense. You have... You have most economists and the, and the OBR only last week saying this is going to cost us about 4% of GDP. We're talking about £100 billion hit to the economy. It's one of, it, although, of course, the war in Ukraine and the pandemic are major factors too, Brexit is a major factor in why it's predicted we'll be bottom, apart from Russia, of the major nations' economies in the, you know, in the next okay. few years. And this is... 
this is, this is is worrying, and the public, I think, are ahead of the politicians. I think Keir Starmer has made a mistake on not even considering the idea of forging links or going back to the single market. Interesting, well, interesting. Well, there you go. Ex ex editor of the Sunday Mirror. Scornful of Keir Starmer's position on Brexit. Paul, always a thrill to have you on the show. Do come back soon. And thanks for your inside track knowledge of the Brexit issue. Uh, more from the papers next. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great good happening. Let him finish. Don't it be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Uh, welcome back to Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. It's exactly 10.30 at this time every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We bring you a full rundown of tomorrow's Sunday papers. And uh, let's have a look at the Telegraph. And the Sunday Telegraph lead with the following. Take a look at this. And uh, quite a big story, let me tell you. Thousands in 12-hour A&E waits every day. Um, about 4,000 patients a day are spending more than 12 hours in A&E as the emergency care system collapses, Britain's top accident and emergency doctor has said. The head of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine issued the warning as nurses prepare for their first national strike in history with two days of action planned before Christmas. Gove fuels Tory revolt as he backs onshore wind farms. Michael Gove has told his allies that he supports ending the ban on onshore wind farms, leaving Rishi Sunak's cabinet split on the issue and fueling a growing 
Tory rebellion. The levelling up secretary is understood to have been joined by Grant Shapps, the business secretary, and Graham Stewart, the climate change minister, in privately supporting the removal of a Cameron-era ban on new turbines. A band of Tory rebels last night reached 30 signatories on an amendment to Mr Gove's planning bill that would allow new developments threatening to inflict a defeat on Rishi Sunak in the House of Commons on the issue. The PM is yet to decide whether to overturn the ban, a decision that some argue would boost the UK's energy security. Beer and sandwiches to avoid train strikes. Ministers must take a grown-up approach and meet union bosses to avoid Christmas rail chaos. Um, also, BBC staff seek racism inquiry. BBC employees have asked for an inquiry into allegations of misogyny and racism at the broadcaster. The chair of a damning review into the culture of the London Fire Brigade has said. Uh, let's have a look now at the Sunday Express. Migrants housed in forced, excuse me, migrants housed in forces homes. Uh, hundreds of military homes have been set aside for migrants, whilst at least two and a half thousand British veterans do not have a roof over their heads. The government's been forced to look at the accommodation amid growing resistance to the use of hotels, B&Bs and holiday camps to house the backlog of 143,000 asylum seekers. OK, let's get to the Sunday Times now. Fire chief will sack racist and sexist workers after horrifying reports on the London Fire Brigade. NHS, BBC and police staff ask for help next. Also, uh, Manston failures led to migrants with diphtheria being moved around the UK. The Independent inside the NHS crisis engulfing mental health care. Patient tells how they were forced to wait for eight days in A&E, not eight hours, eight days. Huge rise in unacceptable emergency delays across the nation. Tens of thousands a month left unable to access vital mental health treatment. The Sun on Sunday, exclusive royal row. Andy Fury at Gungard Axe. Prince Andrew is furious with ministers after being told that his taxpayer-funded police guard is to be axed within weeks. The scandal hit Duke, stripped of his official duties in January, wants the public to continue footing the bill of up to £3 million a year for his gun cops. The Observer now, blow to Brexit as landmark New Deal sees trade slump. Some concerns about a deal signed by Liz Truss as Trade Secretary with Japan in 2020. And police failings, a damning indictment of Tory rule. Sunday Mirror, I'm a celeb excuse exclusive, uh, Jill to score millions. Making a splash, Lioness Jill Scott gets to grips with the Cyclone Challenge in I'm a Celebrity. The footy star finalist is already a winner as juicy financial offers flood in. And we can tell you, dare I say it, can I check now because they're not on? It's a bit of breaking news, which is that uh, old, older... Uh, Hancock, Matt Hancock is in the final three because he's survived elimination. Uh, now, uh, let's have a chat about old, uh, old Matt Hancock in just a moment. Sunday People next. Excuse, exclusive, a UK in curry crisis, cost of living nightmare as restaurants forced to shut. Cormageddon. Curry restaurants are shutting in droves as rocketing costs go through the roof. Britain is facing a Cormageddon with closures threatening to reach one a day. One in four has gone under since 2007 and the remaining 9,000 are fighting to keep their heads above water during the cost of living crisis. One owner said the price of everything's going up. The cost of creating dishes has skyrocketed. And last but not least, the Daily Star Sunday. The snouts are in the trough again, folks. Sprout of order, order. Inflation? MPs will stuff faces with a five-course Christmas meal at the same price they paid in 2021. That's true. If you're a politician, you don't know what inflation looks like, do you? And those are your front pages. Reacting to that, we have Rebecca Jane, who is, of course, the deputy leader of UKIP. We have Olympian and broadcaster Chris Akabusi and top political commentator, the wonderful Albie Amancona. 
let's get to this story in The Express, if I can. Albi, migrants housed in forces homes, plans to move refugees into military units whilst 2,500 British veterans are homeless. Uh, this is an ongoing headache for the government and one that I don't see coming to an end anytime soon. Huge headache for the government and it seems to be a problem that just gets bigger and bigger as the years roll on. Of course, I think it was Sajid Javid who was called back from his holiday when he was Home Secretary back in 2018. There's a couple of hundred migrants across the Channel. Now we're seeing around 40,000 migrants crossing the Channel this year, next year. Will it be more? Where are they all going to be housed? And it seems that the Express have got the scoop that they're going to be housed in some, some, some accommodation that would have been used for veterans. And I'm sure lots of the audience and listeners tonight will be thinking that is a, a complete anathema. Yes, this debate around illegal channel crossings was characterised as an issue for a kind of xenophobic rump perhaps five years ago. But do you think this story has now entered the political mainstream and the, the majority of voters are now concerned about it? I think the story has absolutely entered the political mainstream just because of the sheer numbers of people who are coming across and, of course, these awful stories which are covered in other papers about migrants getting diphtheria in processing centres. Just, just terrible conditions. Whatever you think about people crossing the Channel, people should not be catching diphtheria anywhere in Britain, Correct. full stop. And the fact that people are being kept in such conditions where those diseases can thrive, things that were thriving in the Middle Ages here in Britain, it's just shocking. Uh, this could be a deal breaker for many voters at the next election. If Rishi Sunak doesn't look like he's got a handle on this, that opens the door to Rebecca Jane from UKIP, Richard Tice at Reform UK, and any number of other centre right rivals to the Prime Minister. It's going to be a big problem for the Conservatives at the next general election. Of course, the Conservatives now have been in power for 12 years. The migrant crisis has just gotten worse and worse and worse. The numbers have got no sense of really coming down. There's this Rwanda policy that they hope is going to be the silver bullet. I personally don't think it will be. Um, and they really do need to seem like they've got a grip of this before the next general election. But that, of course, is in two years' time, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to do it. What so, do you think, Chris? Well, the point I want to make about it is the, the scandal is mm. the 2,500 British forces veterans who haven't got a roof over their head. I'm a forces veteran. I've got a roof over my head. But I'd like to think that if I had gone and served my country um, out in the Falklands, for example, yeah. and prepared to pay the ultimate sacrifice, that when I retire, I could at least have a roof over my head. If you read further, though, in this article here, these are not the... Um, um, they're, not, they're not the Albanians, etc. These are... Um, they arrived under the Afghan relocation and assistance policy. And again, you know, we had a responsibility for what we did in Afghanistan. Yeah. And some of these people may be legitimately fleeing persecution from the Taliban. They probably so, were. Yeah, so we've got responsibility there. Mm. But, you know, a lot of what Alpi has said with the cross-channel migrants is extant. I, I agree with him in many, many ways there, and especially with a bit where you said about the diphtheria and 18th century um, illnesses flourishing in 21st century Britain. It's beyond the pale. Well, yes, we saw net migration of half a million people in the last year, which is about the population of Liverpool. Now, Britain is hopefully a very welcoming, diverse and tolerant country, but that's a lot of GPs that you're going to need, a lot of school yes, teachers. Of um, a lot of extra resource, and of course, that's before you even get to housing. Yes, of course, you know the infrastructure is not there to take. But I also think we've got to be very, very careful because how do you, how will the government ultimately solve this issue? Mm. And my fear is that we are being bombarded day in, day out, not with the migrants, but with the fear of the migrants. And ultimately, when they come up with a solution it will end up being some form of digital ID. Mm. And, 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 and that's my, my, my fear, is that we are being nudged and prepared to see this enemy and there is a solution waiting that will be able to differentiate us from them, which will be, end up some sort of digital ID, and then that can go, well, who knows where that's... Where that that's... opens a, a, a massive can yes. of worms in terms of individual liberty, well, uh, well, which, which would be some kind of dystopian hell. So what do we think, Rebecca Jane? This is a hot topic for you, Kip, mm. isn't it? It is. And um, I think this... Uh, 
I'm so, I'm just, I'm out of words. I've spent obviously most of the week actually on GB News talking about different elements of this problem. And the government not only do not have a handle on it, but they don't seem to care. Mm. I actually don't see anything that is other than a token gesture. The fact that we have 2,500 2, British veterans that are homeless mm. is absolutely soul-destroying. And it's not being treated like an emergency. It's not being... It's been completely and utterly overlooked. And if it wasn't for this headline, we wouldn't even know. That's how bad it is, you know. We had a wonderful debate, and actually quite excited for some action to try and take place of, you know, if our government can't do something about it, we have to do something about it. So we are actually on with trying to find people who've had veterans who've had their human rights... Um, infringed by this migrant crisis and we are actually going to represent them and we're going to try and get somewhere with it because our government can't be trusted with this matter anymore. And when Too you think right. about it, some of the veterans, for example, uh, A, they've been institutionalised, you've been in the army for 22 years, okay. you've been looked after, but yeah. also a lot of these guys have seen active service and post-traumatic stress syndrome oh, God, yeah. and that's what incapacitates them often from actually fending for themselves in the civilian it's world. It's not even their fault. It's not a case of pull your socks up. No, 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 no. no. They've, they've uh, experienced things that you're not supposed to see. But one thing I would say about this particular story, as you mentioned, a lot of these migrants who are coming over and going into these military homes are, of course, coming from Afghanistan. Yes. And some of these people may well have been interpreters, people that worked with the British. Correct whilst they're over there. So you could almost see them in a similar light to veterans. I agree. Some might make that comparison. Uh, and we also have a duty to them to keep them safe. I agree. They're fleeing from persecution from the Taliban, as you mentioned. Yeah, before. that's my point, precisely. Uh, yes, uh, lots of points coming in. And actually, your comments there, Chris Akabusi, echoed by Wayne, who says, Mark, migrants equal ID cards. That's why they keep letting them in. It's all about globalisation. Uh, on the... Observer story, who uh, observer there reporting that Brexit's not a success, that trade deal with uh, with Japan apparently is not bearing fruit. I'd say it's a bit too early to uh, to be looking at the impact of Brexit at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Nicolette says, I can't see how Brexit is to blame for a slowdown in trade deals. Surely it's worldwide recession that's more likely. The observer is being Ramonerish and talking us down as usual. Uh, briefly on that, Chris. Um, I think the whole point about Brexit is it's a massive readjustment, it's a big change, it's a big shock to the economy yep. and to our society, and I don't think we can judge Brexit for another decade. Well, exactly. So, Brexit was 2016, and, um, you know, we, we, have, we have such short-termism yes. in the United Kingdom when, actually, many things are... You need the art of, of the long view. Now, if we hadn't had... Um, if we hadn't had the COVID, if we hadn't had the response to COVID, if we hadn't had the war, if we had, didn't have supply chain issues, if we didn't have a global recession, you might be able to say five years down the road, how are we doing with Brexit? But the fact is, we've had all of these seismic, cataclysmic um, bangs to the economy. Well, Brexit hasn't had a chance. We haven't had a chance to have these interpersonal relations to develop these op opportunities. So sit back, hang on, Let's get ourselves through COVID, through the pandemic, through the ramifications of the war, and then let's judge ourselves in 2025, 2030, 2035. It's the art of a long view. We were tied down in the, in the European Economic Union. Well, in fact, if it had just been the EEC, I'd have been happy. It was, for me, the military union, the political union, and not being able to vote out people from Brussels who have all these issues on our lives. That was my challenge, and that's why I wanted to be in Brexit Let's give it a chance. Uh, Albia Mancona, I voted Remain, but I will fight with every cell in my body to make sure it's not reversed. And I'm starting to think that long-term Brexit's going to be a success. It's an insurance policy against ever closer union or being a member of the United States of Europe. I believe that the Eurozone is headed for a colossal sovereign debt crisis that we're not going to have to deal with because we're out. It's an insurance policy against a single European army. Look how disastrous yes. the EU's response to Ukraine was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, uh, it's control of our borders, our money. The fundamentals of Brexit are still there. It just needs time. 
The fundamentals of Brexit are still there. It does need time. But ultimately, I think you will speak to many Brexiteers who will be arguing that actually Brexit hasn't been implemented very well by this government, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, we do need to give it time to look at the successes and the opportunities which are out there. But we look at issues like the Northern Ireland Protocol, that's still very much not resolved. So people often talk about Brexit being done. The last government under Boris Johnson use that phrase quite a lot, but it's not really done. There's still some serious work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, get Brexit done. Rebecca Jane, a couple oh. of seconds on this. I can't not let you talk about Brexit. How can we even talk about Brexit <laughs> when Brexit has been implemented by a bunch of people that never even wanted it, they've taken no opportunities, and the mainstream media is highly against it? Forget about it. Get somebody in power that actually believes in it. Uh, listen, uh, we're going to talk about Matt Hancock next. Uh, has he rescued his reputation in the jungle? Uh, we've also got uh, a great story about how Primark and uh, Poundland are opening a bunch of new stores. Are cheap shops better? Uh, or at least just as good? And would you wear sandals to meet the king? Find out what that story is next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, man. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back. I've just had Rebecca Jane explain what an air fryer is. Because in the Sunday Mirror, they've got a great... And this, as far as I'm concerned, is breaking news. Um, they've got a competition, win an Iceland air fryer. I don't know what an air fryer is. What is an air fryer? Have you got one, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Um, Chris akabusi has got an air fryer. Yep. Uh, what does it do? I, I, ste I, steam it, I steam in it, I bake in it, I can fry in it. The air fries! So, essentially, it's... <laughs> It's, you, it's a bit like this panel. It's you, hot air, isn't you it? Do, you, 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 you just press the buttons, 
stick your food in and move off. I'm going to steam it. I'll put a little bit of water in the bottom of the All right. Well, oh, listen. Nice with Obzon. you. Akabusi. Akabusi, you always, uh, <laughs> you always press my buttons. <laughs> and you get me nice and toasty. Uh, uh, we've got lots of more stories for the papers, actually. I want to get to our cheap shops better in a second, but I'm a celebrity exclusive in the Sunday Mirror. And uh, this is about the very talented lioness, Jill Scott, who is expected to make millions when she leaves the jungle, as will Matt Hancock, I suspect, who's now down to the last three. Mike Tyndall has exited. Has he been forgiven by the British public, Matt Hancock, do you think? I don't think... Well, I don't know if he's been forgiven uh, as far as the, what went on through the pandemic, but you've seen the other side of him. You've been able to see the human side of him and... Um, you know, you, you get to see it. He hadn't been a politician. He might be a good bloke down the pub, you know, and, and have some fun with. I mean, he's, he's a go-getter. Look, I've not really watched it, but from what I've heard, you know, he's a go-getter. He's self for all of the trials. The public keep on... Al, LB keeps on voting for... Right. <laughs> Is that right? I, <laughs> <do. laughs> I voted for him twice last night, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Hancock, I'm really shocked to say this because I was, you know, I was disappointed when he first went in because I really wanted him on the Treasury Select Committee. I thought we had a long career in Parliament ahead of him. <laughs> but that was not to be. He decided to go on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And I don't think anyone expected him to be in the final, but I think he, sh he showed that there is a human side to politicians. And I think people have been able to separate the mistakes of COVID, which happened, and no-one is denying that, from someone that is a human who's coming across quite well on a reality television show and actually smashing all of the challenges and being bullied by the other campmates. Everyone likes an underdog in Britain. Well, everyone likes an underdog. Uh, the British public don't like to see someone ganged up upon. Yeah, and he was. took it with dignity. Uh, plus, it's a great redemption story, isn't it? We all love a good redemption story. Let's see if he will be forgiven for his mistakes over COVID. That is yet to be seen. But I'd quite like to see Matt Hancock win. Uh, will the public be sickened, Rebecca Jane, though, if when he leaves the jungle he makes millions outside of politics? <sighs> so hard. Or is it like, will the public just think, oh, good luck to you? I think that they probably will be... I mean, there's always going to be people on both sides, like we said. There's always somebody offended somewhere. Um, I think that there will be very much those people that are quite pleased for him that he's managed to turn it round. I think people will be still very angry about the things that have mm. happened. But the way that it got turned around for him was because of the reaction of the other campmates and the way that he was absolutely set upon. Nobody likes that. And if that hadn't have happened... I don't think he'd have done so well. Yeah, I mean, I've got to say that the Matt Hancock story is confusing and contradictory. Uh, yes, the CCTV snog with his missus was completely <laughs> unacceptable because it was against the rules. Uh, but actually, uh, people are angry with him because he didn't lock down quickly enough. Well, that wasn't his decision. That was the Prime Minister's decision. Uh, but let's be honest, this is a guy that did lock us down three times. And my problem with him isn't mm. the speed of his lockdowns, it's the fact that he presided over them at all. Uh, so it's hard to pin on Matt Hancock what exactly he did wrong. Um, let's get to this story. And uh, it's actually a fascinating one. It's all about cheap shops, which I've got to say I'm a very, very big fan of. Um, and the news is that Primark and Poundland have announced that they will be opening several new high street outlets. So are we now in the age of the low cost shop? And what do we think of cheap outlets. Are they as good as posh stores? Chris? I, I don't like them. Um, I think we've been in this era for quite a while and behind every single one of those. Um, I think that there's probably some poor kid somewhere working extra hard. Now, I hear you, but Albie, I've done some research and it turns out that a lot of the posh brands use the same sweatshops as Primark and others. And the reason why Primark is so cheap is because they don't advertise and they buy in bulk. Full disclosure, I love Primark. I think it's brilliant value and great quality. And I think all you've got to do is make sure that you buy those clothes and keep them and don't dispose of them. What's your view? This is the thing. It's about buying things and keeping them. In, in our house, we call Primark, we call it Primani. Beautiful. We'll like, oh, we've just bought a Primani special today. Um, look, the quality in Primark, 
questionable, I think. It's some not things, that bad, though, is some, it? Some things can be good, some things can be bad. I bought a, a suit from Primark, actually. I think it was about £19 a few was years ago. Was that for ago. a quarter appearance? And the, well, yes, <laughs> it was. You, you, you've got me, Mark. The quality was a bit iffy, but it did the job for the day. Um, but look, people living in a cost-of-living crisis, they need to be able to buy clothes, and these budget sh stores like Primark or Matalan are really helping people oh, through this a really crisis. good point. They're a godsend to people, especially mums and dads that have got to get their kids a school uniform. They yep. go to Primark and get those normal grey jumpers and the trousers for school. I find them quite hard-wearing. And don't get me started on Poundland, all-time favourite shop. What do you think, RJ? I really like it. Everything's mm. a pound. No, it's not. That's it's a slight not. lie, isn't it? It's yeah, not. what is that about, by it's the way? Not. Most like... of it's a pound, but you'll get, like, a big aerial will be three quid. It's still not bad. Yeah, mm. there are... Listen, I like it. I'm happy. I think that, you know, why are you going to pay £50 for a white T-shirt when you can go to Primark and get one for £3? It's ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's all within reason. Uh, let's do a couple of seconds on the gentleman who met the King in Crocs. Mm. Now, understandably... Uh, King Charles saw the funny side because the person that he met was uh, very elderly and infirm and uh, wore a pair of Crocs, which are basically these kind of rubber uh, sandals. He was very <laughs> well-dressed otherwise, and it was a lovely moment. Uh, but what do we think about Crocs, yes or no? And uh, what do your shoes say about you, Albie? Well, first of all, <laughs> the, man, the man you described as elderly and infirm is David Hockney, one of the most celebrated artists... Very true. ..of the late 20th and 21st century. I thought I'd get that in there. Get that in, baby. Um, <laughs> but, but Crocs, you know, they're great, they're comfortable, they don't look very nice, but they're comfy. I've got a pair. I, I, took, I took the bins out in them earlier on. Well, I tell you what, your suede shoes are a far better replacement. Uh, thank you to my brilliant panel, who will return soon, and thanks to your company. We're back tomorrow at 9 for a big, big show. Headliners is next. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News.